Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another Saturday movie gathering. We have a really good one. <laughs> it seems like we always get blessed with these amazing movies. Absolutely amazing. And, and this one, of course, came through the prayers of you praying and submitting the themes that you, you would like to have addressed and to come into a living experience of the theme in your heart, which is the joy of, of living, of the joy of, of having the Spirit come through you and feeling so connected and so content and so relaxed and so joyful. That's it. That's, that's why we come together, just for that and nothing more. So it's beautiful and it's, it's very, very simple. So the poll that you gave, the combined poll of, of uh, English, Spanish, and our, our tribe contributors now. We have a, a triple stream coming into the combined poll and giving us what it is that we really want to focus on for this week. So in the combined poll, coming in, number one, was living spontaneously and without a future. Just think how joyful that is, living spontaneously and without a future. We're talking akuna matata. No cares, no worries for the rest of your life. Akuna matata. I mean, really really in that state of mind where you have such trust that you can really embrace the present moment. Now with the Disney Lion King, you know, Akuna Matata was, you know, they, they ate bugs. And we don't necessarily advocate that you have to take a diet of bugs uh, to go for Akuna Matata, but we're, we are saying that the present moment offers you everything that you could ever want or ever need. It's all right here, right now. So that's our first uh, theme, living spontaneously and without a future. That had 83 votes. That's by far the top uh, theme. So we had to come up with really a movie that shows and demonstrates living spontaneously and without a future. And second was releasing the need for validation or approval. Again, how freeing if you didn't have that voice in your mind wondering what other people will think. Will they approve? Will they like me? Will I still be loved and accepted if I do what I feel called to do? It's releasing people pleasing basically is releasing the need for validation and, or approval. And that really is re releasing the self-concept of the past because it's only the past that has taught us we have to earn respect. We have to earn the love. We have to earn the honesty. We don't have to earn anything. Christ is, is a gift from God and everything was given in our creation. So we don't have to earn it or somehow develop it. It's, it's a given. But we do have to accept it. We have to accept it. We have to accept ourselves as God created us. That's the, the key point. The third one is undoing the doer by being done through. So this is a conflict for many that are on the spiritual journey. They feel like they transfer this obsession with doing, this obsession with being productive, this obsession with earning their way and proving their worth and demonstrating that they are enough. It's, it's an obsession, but, but the ego invented the body, which is the doer, and then, as soon as you believe that you are the body, it obsessively hammers the mind with guilt. Have I done enough? Did I do what I should have done? Uh, am, was my behavior appropriate or not? Uh, was I good, a good enough uh, doer as a father, as a mother? 
as a, as a citizen, <laughs> as a, a daughter or a son, was I a good enough doer? And this theme is saying, undoing the doer by being done through. Letting the Spirit come through so graciously, so effortlessly, so simply, that you become identified with the purpose of forgiveness, with, with the Spirit. And this uh, third theme reminds me of a, of a quote from Jesus in A Course in Miracles, where he says, it cannot be difficult to do the task that Christ appointed for you, for it is he who does it. In other words, Christ, upon invitation, will do all things through you. And, and even Jesus said, you know, greater things than I will you do. Meaning, the Holy Spirit's going to light up your mind. And the things that I seem to do 2,000 years ago are, are going to be just a wisp of a memory as you experience being done through by Spirit. And you experience more of, we'll call it, an involuntary life. My life is not my own. Uh, like St. Francis's prayer, Lord, make me an instrument. And then you just take your hands off the wheel. You just enjoy what comes from being surrendered over to, to Spirit. Do it through me. Speak through me. Love through me. Laugh through me. Smile through me. Hug through me. Let you be the one that inspires the use of this puppet, uh, which we call the body. Uh, in the Bible, it was said, it is not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. M meaning, if I'm under Christ's control, then my worries are over. If I'm under egoic control, if I think I personally have to run the show or figure things out, or be the one that does the things required for salvation. You'll feel pressure, stress, expectations. You'll feel heavy. But if you are not the one, in terms of the person, who's responsible for saving the world, thank good it's a presence of love <laughs> that's in your heart that's going to save the world, not you as a person. <laughs> you don't have to worry, you're off the hook. It's not like you're being called as a, a personal savior. But you do have a part to play. And that part is your special function. And that will be given to you moment by moment. It's just, again, living spontaneously in the moment without a future. Then forgiveness is the key to happiness. And we're not talking about necessarily forgiving a person. We're talking about being able to just see the false as false. In this movie today, our main character, he comes out of, out of India and he comes out of the, we'll say, the Hindu tradition and his holy scripture was not a, the Bible. It wasn't A Course in Miracles. It was the, the Bhagavad Gita and the ancient Vedic teachings uh, from India. What's so great about the ancient Vedic teachings? They're non-dual. Anytime you get your non-dual teachings, I don't care if it comes through in China, in India, uh, or through a modern day scripture like A Course in Miracles, which is extremely non-dual, that is coming and bringing your mind into the focus and alignment with God is one. With reality is one. Spirit is singular. The soul is singular. Everything that comes back to oneness, pure divine love and oneness, is, is non-duality. Is... Uh, as they say, neti neti in the East, not, not this, not that. And non-duality is basically, is teaching us that, that reality is not two, reality is one. 
even though our five senses show us a, a multiplicity and a dualistic world of up and down and hot and cold and fast and slow and male and female and masculine and feminine, everything we perceive through the five senses is, is dualistic until we forgive. And that's why forgiveness is the key to happiness. There is a way of looking on this world where the body's eyes continue to report differences, but the healed mind has put them all into one category. They are not real. Ooh, that's non-dual. There's your non-dual happiness. And, and then the ego says, oh yeah, you're not going to survive if you go in that direction. Oh, you'll do more than survive. You'll be in the, the sweet grace of my, my sweet Lord, hallelujah, Hare Krishna. Yeah, you're going to enjoy some, some, uh, some Beatles music. <laughs> We're going to go with George again. George seems to be breaking into all of our movies. George, George, I feel you with us now. You, every time we have a celebration movie, George is there, George Harrison. Uh, and what a heart. One of these days I'm going to show, I'm going to have to do it over two Saturdays though, because I've got a documentary on George Harrison called Living in the Material World. Uh, no, it's not the Madonna song. Uh, material girl. It's, no, it's George Harrison living in a material world, but it's so big. I think it's three hours and 47 minutes, so I have to show it on two Saturdays. We have to do a double header, a double version, first and second. But George is coming in again today. George always comes shining in to bring the love, to bring the happiness, to bring the truth. And last one is trusting in mighty companions. Many of us have believed that, that the journey to God is a lonely journey. All by myself, don't want to be. Yeah, we do want to be all by ourselves. We want to be with our, our divine self, and not, not a lonely body wandering in time and space, lost in space. We want to know the truth. We want to know the joy. We want to know the happiness of, of our eternal moment that goes on forever and ever and ever. So trusting in mighty companions means just having the willingness to be done through and to let the spirit direct our relationships. We're going to see the main character is a Swami who's going to come from India to the United States, uh, up to the New, New England area. He's going to come to New York City, like Paramahansa Yogananda did. Paramahansa Yogananda one day woke up and he had this, this strong feeling inside that his guru was telling him he needed to go west and he needed to go to America. It's the same with our our Swami today, he's going to wake up, but unlike uh, Paramahansa, who was, who was still a, a fairly much of a young man, uh, our gentleman today, he's going he's gonna to wake up and he's 70 years old. 70 years old, and he's going to hear that he's to come to New York City uh, from Calcutta. And he doesn't have any money. That makes for a very fun ride. You're 70 years old, you don't have any money, and you're told to go across the oceans from Calcutta to New York City. That is how the spirit really opens your heart wide when you are taken way beyond your expectation, beyond your imagination, beyond what you would consider the the safe probabilities of how your life could go. Whoa, that, that is on another level. And in one sense, this is going to show us, the Swami will show us that age is not an excuse. If, 
if this man can follow the spirit at 70 years old and is penniless, uh, then we, none of us have an excuse. <laughs> we, we, are, we have absolutely no excuse. If he, can, if he can give his self over to the Lord, uh, which for him is, in his context, growing up in, in great traditions of India, this is Lord Krishna. And Jesus and Lord Krishna, are, they're really good friends because they're one. <laughs> I've had people, I started putting some some George Harrison things and posting a few things uh, over the years, the, the music, My Sweet Lord, and, and uh, all about peace and everything like this. And then somebody made a comment uh, on one of my YouTubes, David, the Beatles had a different Lord than Lord Jesus. And I was like, oh my God, here we go again. Who is Lord? Well, we actually know that the Lord is one. <laughs> In case we're concerned, if it's the right Lord, there's only one Lord. <laughs> and the Lord is the Lord of life. And there are many pathways to God, and Christianity is one of them, and there are many, many others. And yet God is one, so the many paths disappear uh, in the experience of the one. The one has always been the one. The one is not many, the one is one. Uh, guess who invented multiplicity? Guess who invented diversity? Guess who invented duality? It's called ego, <laughs> edging God out. It's called ego, death wish ego. Multiplicity and diversity and duality are not coming from the love of eternal life, the heavens. The, the Lord is one. I just, when I saw that quote, or that, that, uh, that little post that somebody made a comment saying the Beatles were not following the same Lord, I just was like, oh my God, Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. What's the problem with one Lord? Why is everybody getting all hung up about uh, different Lords? So I actually, uh, I did the same thing the Beatles did at some point. The Beatles decided to go to India and they went to Rishikesh, uh, this little tiny little village up there, kind of north, uh, north of Delhi, north, northeast of Delhi. And the Beatles went to Rishikesh and they, they met with a guru and I went to Rishikesh. And I actually got to, yeah, I got to meet with some gurus there was a woman who just came to where I was staying and she took my hand and she led me into an ashram in India and I got to meet the, the gurus and I got to go down by the Ganges River and be with all the parties and celebrations and bright colors and chanting. It was fun. It's fun. Let's not be to, too stuffy with our Course in Miracles, let's, let's realize that we're all the same one. We're all the same one. It's a big celebration. And I had a wonderful time. I actually gave a very small satsang. I gave a satsang and I wasn't very well known in Rishikesh. So two people came to my satsang and a monkey. And the monkey sitting in the window. And the monkey stayed there and listened to me the whole time. I probably talked for two or two and a half hours. That monkey was going nowhere. He was, he was very attentive to the love I was extending. But we have to remember we're all the same one. That's the teachings of A Course in Miracles. That's the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. That's the teaching of the ancient Vedas. We are the same one. We are the same self we've always been. We're not buying this trick of differences anymore. We are the same, not separate. We are the same, not divided. Sameness is real. Differences are insane. <laughs> when you heal, when you forgive, you realize that differences had, do not matter and they were never real. Not even for an instant. 
our differences real. And that's where the happiness comes in. So our, our Swami is coming across from Calcutta. He's going to come to New York City. It's, he has to be there and face wintertime. He's never seen snow before. He doesn't have any money. He's come all the way on a, a cargo ship across from India. He has no money and it, he has to face snow and a, and a, a what, what they would say a, a big snow, a bad winter in New York City. And he's just trusting in divine providence. He's just, he's following the present moment. He's following his inspiration. He's following what he was meant to do for the, the Lord of life. He, he is a follower of the Lord of life and he is a devoted follower of the Lord of life. He has much to teach us all about devotion. He is, he is devoted. He doesn't waste time. <laughs> That's what I know about I really like about this movie is he just doesn't waste time. He's so in the moment and he's so fully in the moment that he's so fully in the service of the one that it never really occurs to him uh, to struggle about what should I do because he is done through. What is so good about that is because he's happy. He is, he is really happy, and happiness is the best teacher. If you're going to learn from a teacher, learn from happiness. Don't settle for less than happiness. Why would you want to learn from something other than happiness? And I'm talking happiness based on a present moment contentness. I'm not talking happiness based on outcomes in this world. That, that won't ever work. This is just from a very simple, pure, inner happiness that, that is radiated out. The other thing is, he doesn't seem to have a dichotomy between work and leisure. The, you know, some people say, this guy seems like he's working all the time. I think he's always in leisure. He's smiling so much that I think he's just tapped into the present moment leisure of being carried by the Spirit. He's carried. He's not got to care or worry. And, and this is, you know, if you ask him, he'd say, oh, well, yeah, I, I've gone through some struggles in my life. The other thing I like about, about this Swami is um, his conditioning. You know, I'm always talking about how we have to undo ego conditioning. We have to do, undo all this programming, ego programming. Uh, the, the Course is saying this, this Course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is far beyond what could be taught. It aims at removing the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. And that's, I would just say, that's unwinding from all this past conditioning. Well, let's take a look at our Swami. Back in 1920, we'll see a photo of our Swami with a nice big black mustache in 1920. Handsome young man back in, in 20. And, and as we hear him talk, we're going to hear him talk about his father. And what he has to say about his father is, his father did not want him to use his life making money. What? What? His father did not want him to use his life making money. Well, there's a different direction than most of us uh, face with our programming. Imagine having a father who whose one wish for you is to live your life to go, devoted to God. That's it? What about expectations about education? What about career? What about making money? No, no, no. Nada, nada, nada. Well, well. Now we start to see how he can travel to New York City without a penny at 70 years old. Because you roll the clock back and you say, what kind of 
upbringing that he had. He had a father who did not want his son devoted to making money. He wanted a son devoted to God. And wow, he got one. Uh, the other thing is, is that you can relate to him in the sense that as he goes through his life, he does get married and he does have a child. So this guy is, you can relate to him. You know, he is a father like that, which may be, We'll say he's got a real good booster start with a father like that. He's not undoing the whole idea of what should I do for a living. It's not there. <laughs> it, the seed was never planted. <laughs> Whoa, that comes from a lot of Indian tradition too. This is not so unusual to have a father like that. Second of all, he has a teacher. He has a guru and the guru is telling him about love. The guru is telling him about happiness. And in Indian culture, you have lineage. So the guru had a guru, had a guru, had a guru. His guru has a lineage of 5,000 years. Whoa, that is deep. His guru is teaching him based on a lineage, and it's just the concept of time, but it, I mean, that's a pretty strong symbol. It's been passed on from teacher to teacher and teacher for 5,000 years. And that's right, the Vedas go back a long, long way. This is a powerful non-dual teaching, you know. Advaita Vedanta, not Two, that's the teachings of the lineage that this guru comes from. Not two. Wow. A 5,000 year lineage of not two. And so let's take a look now at our young, young Swami. He's, he's got a guru who's got a 5,000 year lineage of not two, non-duality. And he is inspired by a father who says, you should not devote your life to making money. You should devote your life to God. Well, there you go. That's, that's the roots of this smile. You're going to see a smile. That's what's underneath the smile. It's not necessarily education. It's not necessarily wealth. It's not necessarily a, a cushy, cushy, life of convenience. There's a 5,000 year tradition of gurus and, a, and a, a father who said, don't use your life to make money. That's what's behind that smile. That smile is not there by accident. So we're gifted here is we're gonna to get to watch a movie about this guy and what happens when he lands in New York City without a penny. Whoa, teaching time. And, and I can give you one little clue is, if you're going to teach, it's best to teach with something that's practical. I find that non-dual scriptures are extremely practical. I find that singing is extremely practical. I find that dancing is extremely practical. What happens when you put together a, a teaching demonstration that involves non-dual scriptures and singing and dancing. Oh, oh, oh. And then you throw in the Beatles and you throw in George Harrison on top of that. Oh my goodness. You got a, a perfect storm brewing there. Non-dual scriptures, singing, dancing, and George Harrison recording a song that points to you. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Whoa! Watch how this is not a, a, this is the spirit doing it all. The spirit is going to light the place up. What is he lighting up? I'm talking about planet Earth. He's going to light up planet Earth with a seven year old man who's penniless who takes a cargo ship across the ocean to New York City. And he's not even received in New York City. There's nobody waiting for him. There's nobody waiting for him. 
He's going in blind, which is a good thing too, because you don't need to know what your future would be because all we have is the present moment. And that's all he has. That's all he has is the present moment. Even with the symbols of the, the 5,000 year teachings of non-duality and his, his guru, still, you can't, you can't carry those in your pocket. Those are just things that are buried in your heart, that are just a desire to serve the Lord. So in this case, it's going to be Lord Krishna. Now, when I was in Rishikesh, I, I liked it. I went around to the different places and I got to see all the statues and I like it. I like it because I finally got to, to meet a statue of Lord Krishna and it's not every day you get to meet a blue man. I mean, I like that, you know. You're not going to find many blue saints. <laughs> And that really, that was exciting, and I thought, wow. And, but now, even more than the blue Krishna, now you're going to get to see the smile of the face of someone who cares, of someone who, who extends love to everyone around him, who brings a blessing wherever he goes who has people that are excited to meet with him every day because they don't know what he's going to say or do. He's, he's so in the present moment. That's exciting when you meet somebody and you don't know what they're going to do, but you know what, how they feel. You know the love that comes from them. You know the love that emanates from them and that is what draws you. You're not being drawn to some kind of a program, future program. You're not being drawn to some future hope. You're being drawn to the present moment from the presence of the Lord. And it seems to be coming through this, most people would say it, elderly man. Elderly man. So, what a ride. What a ride we have today. What an exciting ride. Uh, we're going to let the Holy Spirit and Jesus show us the way through a, a parable that uh, I'm so grateful it was recorded. I'm so grateful it was recorded. I feel like we're honored to be able to come across movies where we actually can see a living demonstration. And we love our movies. We love to to have the Spirit show us through the commentary that we all are the same one, metaphysically. But every once in a while we have a demonstration that comes along and we're just honored to be able to behold that demonstration because it's a witness to our own mind. It's, our, it's a witness to our own heart. It's what we want in, the, in our heart of hearts. And when we see a demonstration of it, then we go, wow. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. In a world of, of distractions, in a world of fragments, in a world of multiple images, we need a witness of that simple, pure unity. We need a witness of that because it reminds us of our pure, simple unity. <laughs> that's why we need it. We need it to be reminded. And that's the Holy Spirit coming through, in this case, a, a tradition of, of, of Swami from, from the East. So sit back, enjoy this beautiful witness, and I will pop in during the movie for p different times to Maybe join and point out a few things, bring in a few more uh, ideas from the Holy Spirit and Jesus. But just really savor this, you know. This is, uh, this is another one of those movies where you can just savor it, savor it all. Now, is anybody noticing something similar? This is 1965, New York City. He's up, a homeless man in, going from office to office, and he's got his typewriter. And right there are Bill Thedford and Helen Shuckman 
And they're in an office building, <laughs> right there in New York City. And Helen, in 1965, has, is hearing this repetitive thought in her mind. This is a course in miracles. Please take notes. And her boss, Bill Thetford, has a typewriter just like the one we saw. So our Swami is over there typing away in his office. And then in the same city, Bill Thetford begins to reassure Helen, just take it down, I'll type it out. He's typing with one hand and he's assuring her with the other hand, relax, it's okay. The Holy Spirit is slipping into New York City in 1965. The voice of Jesus Christ being taken down so clearly for the first time in 2,000 years, <laughs> almost 2,000 years, and he's slipping a Swami into New York City at the very same year. Don't you love the Holy Spirit in a world that is lost, in a world that is a fantasy, it's a fiction of separation from God, it's a fiction that you can live apart from the Creator, it's a fiction of, of pain, of war, of conflict. And there in New York City, 1965, the Holy Spirit is slipping in a Swami unbeknownst to New York City and two research psychologists who are in Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center and, and beginning the dictation of A Course in Miracles. Whoa, there's something going on there. <laughs> you know, how grateful are we for this? How grateful are we to have the herald of the end of separation, to have joy, to have happiness. The seeds are being planted and the seeds will germinate. The seeds have germinated. <laughs> I don't know if you can feel it, but they are really germinating. The flowers are popping bright, bright colors. The, the pollination of joy is, is spreading across the earth. And we are the ones who are ready to hear it, ready to take it into our hearts, ready to live it. So to me, that's what I thought of when I, when I saw him going from office, office to office in New York City in 1965. I, I was thinking, yeah, there's something else going on in an office in New York City in 1965. And it's it's really wonderful. Something wonderful is being planted that will have many, many fruits uh, for us. And right now, even this moment, we're starting to feel the, the gratitude, the absolute gratitude for this. Thank God for the plan of awakening. <laughs> Thank God that for the end of suffering for the end of conflict, for the end of war. Thank God, all glory to God for this. And, uh, and you see, God doesn't really care if you call it Lord Krishna or Lord Jesus Christ or Lord Fred. Uh, you know, it, God, is not, God knows not of time and space. <laughs> so why would God be concerned if it's the the Krishna word, or the Jesus word, or the, the Muhammad word, or whatever. The, you could call it Atman, or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really, the names don't matter. It's the living experience in your heart of joy and happiness and love and peace. That's what is the presence of God. That's the living presence of God. So here we go. He's. He's just typing away in his little uh, office, he, whatever office he can find. But he looks pretty much like a homeless man who's <laughs> trying to stay out of the snow, <laughs> who's not wasting a moment, though. He's typing away like Bill Thetford is down the street. Uh, they're both typing away. And they've got something important that they're typing. 
And it's something that's non-dual. And it's something that the world's been waiting for centuries to hear about. And for centuries to experience. And he's typing away with those little fingers going, 70 years old, no money. He's, he's at work. So to the world, this is radical. <laughs> On the streets, in the parks of New York City, chanting and dancing. But you notice he did it based on this teacher, this very inspirational teacher from 500 years earlier in India, who seemed to appear in very troubled times at that, in the 1500s of India. And then through dance, through music, through his devotion, began chanting and praising God and worshiping God and welcoming everyone uh, from different religions, different theologies to come and join the party. How beautiful this saint was 500 years ago in India and here this is in his heart. So he's He's following his inspiration, just like Gandhi followed his inspiration for nonviolence and would even do things like marching to the sea to make salt on the beach, even though it was against the rule, the British rule, to make salt on the beach. He would march to the beach to make salt. Here we have Bravapu, he's he's just going with what the inspiration is. He's, he's got his matchless gifts, this tiny little street front in New York City where teenagers are showing up with drug problems and, and all the struggles of being a, a teenager or a young person in their 20s in, in New York City, all the emotional turmoil and everything, and he's just welcoming one guy came in, how are you feeling? I'm tired. Well, come and lay in here. He invites him. His first day, he just says, I'm tired. He says, come and stay there, right on the floor of matchless gifts. That's a matchless gift, uh, to welcome your brothers and sisters with such a warm, open heart and open arms. And they're just walking through the door and saying, I'm tired. And he's like, here, laid here. The welcoming is, is beautiful, and then it's not long after he just says, go out, go out to the streets. Now, the ego would not give you a guidance like that because the ego would say, oh my God, this is New York City, and we're going to go dancing and chanting in the streets. What will become of us? Will we be arrested? Will we be herded? into some paddy wagon and taken and put into jail? Uh, will we be uh, screamed at, yelled at? Will there be physical violence? It was just go out and, and dance and sing and chant. And this again is coming from an inner prompt. He has an adoration for, for the saints and the mystics. His father you know, we now know what his father was doing. Even as a little child, he would go in there and his father was just sitting there hour upon hour upon hour with his, with his little altar, with the, little, with the saints, and he was worshiping God. Okay, what a father. What a father. The only thing that's important is God. There is nothing else but God. The, God is it. And to, to spend your days just sitting in devotion, praising and worshiping God. You know, I know a lot of people, <laughs> my family, friends, and a lot of people that I grew up with would say, that's, that's a fanatic. He's a fanatic to sit there and worship God. I think not. I think not. In fact, Jesus has has a workbook lesson, 184, where Jesus says, the name of God is my inheritance. Jesus actually in the Course, if you hang with the workbook enough and you do enough of his lessons, he will actually say to you in one of his lessons, 
Today, I want you to focus on one thought, God. Let the name of God be the only thought in your mind you focus on. Let the name of God replace all other senseless, useless names. And he's talking trillions and trillions of senseless, useless names. And he's telling us in, a, in his workbook to focus solely for the day on one idea, God, and focus on the name of God. And so I think not that this father was a fanatic. I think this father actually was inspired, and, and that is part of the Indian tradition, to, to have a harmony with God, to live in harmony. That's where joy comes from, from God. That's where happiness comes from, from God. Peace of mind, from God. Is there any other source? No, actually not. Actually not, honestly. You want the straight truth? Actually, there is no other source. And that's what Jesus is teaching us also with the Course, that God is the cause and that our identity is the effect, the Christ. And more importantly than that, there is no other cause. You don't have to focus when I say there's no causation in the world. What I'm really saying is, there is no cause but God. There is nothing to focus your mind on except God. There is nothing valuable about time and space. Some of you might remember workbook lesson 133, I will not value what is valueless. That sounds pretty good when you really read the lesson. You read the title, I will not value what is valueless. That's, that's good. Especially if I'm, I'm wanting to be happy, that's like, that's like really key. And then he says, it's, it's helpful to bring people back from uh, high ideas to something that's very, very practical. And I'm like, yeah, you got me here. I'm ready for the practical. Bring it on. Whatever it is, lesson 133, bring it on, Jesus. I'm ready for the practical. I, there's been a lot of high ideas you've been sharing, but okay, give me the basic practical. He said, the criteria for what is valuable and valueless is this. If it will last forever, it has all value. And if it won't last forever, it has no value whatsoever. Strike three for the ego, you are out. That is Jesus Christ speaking. And, and this is, it shouldn't surprise you, Lesson 133, because if you roll it back to a few lessons, Lesson 128, the world I see holds nothing that I want. And in that lesson, he says, the only thing that's valuable of this world, always got my attention with starting off with a sentence like that, the only thing that's valuable in this world is that you pass it by. Oh, 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 the kingdom of heaven is within. Oh, time and space are out. God did not create a meaningless world. We do not want to try to tie God into history, into perception. We don't want to try to tie God into the temporary. If God is eternal, what, what business does God have with the temporary? No. So, so this is what's so important, is that our Swami here has grown up, even as a child, seeing the, 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 the flames and the, the Krishna and the saints and his father just sitting there hour upon hour upon hour. It looked like him and his, maybe his sister come into the room and then he says, I want to worship what the deity, I want to worship God like you. And so what does the father do? He makes a cute little altar for the kids to worship at too. How beautiful is that? The children learn by their father that he's so devoted to God and then they want the same because children do look up to their mother and their father and they do, they're curious, they want to know the way. Mom and dad didn't seem, dad didn't seem so interested in education. 
Dad didn't seem so interested in recreation. Dad didn't seem so interested in, back then they didn't have maybe TVs with cartoons running all day long, Tom and Jerry fighting each other or something. I look at, I look at what I grew up with on TV and I'm like thinking, oh my God, a little child who goes to their father and says, I want to worship the deity, the God that you're worshiping. Now that's a start to learning the difference between the valueless and the valuable. And I would have to say that our 70-year-old Swami here who lands in New York City, he's got something in his heart that's a big gift. Even though the world didn't seem to greet him there, even though he had to just wander the streets a bit and be found by a couple of the boys and then some more of the boys who came and finally said, let's, let's get a storefront here, matchless gifts. <laughs> let's, you know, you can see it's all just being provided from his devotion to the present moment. He's staying connected, even though ego is trying to say you're, you're dep it's depressing that there is nothing, nobody is receiving what your, your gift is. And what does he do? He goes back to Krishna and he says, Krishna, there must be a reason, a purpose for why you brought me to New York City. So I'll dance for you. How's that? How's that for a purpose? How's that for a motivation? How's that for not succumbing to depression? Not succumbing to rejection? Not succumbing to uh, oh, nobody wants to hear what I have to offer. Even though he knows he's got these, these great memories of this deep tradition, non-dual tradition in his heart, it doesn't seem like there's many takers. It's like New York City is not paying attention. And of course, down the street, uh, Helen Schuckman's taken down some words too in her inner dictation. This is a course in miracles. It is a required course. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It just means you can decide what you want to take at a given time. And then he goes on to say this, you know, that this course does not attempt to teach the meaning of love, for that cannot be taught. And then he comes, works his way. It could be, this course can therefore be summarized. Nothing real can be threatened. Spirit cannot be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. That's time and space. That's right, don't even get into astral projection or tell me you want to go to other worlds, meet the aliens, meet ET. You know, no, no, no. Nothing unreal exists. You don't need to find, go to other realms. You don't need this astral projection. You don't need psychic abilities. You simply have to have the desire for God. That's it. That's the whole point of the world, is to turn to God. And we're getting a pretty good witness here because he did not land and he did not say, oh, I'm going to make a plan to bring Krishna here. He did have the prayer in his heart, I would like to open a temple in, uh, in New York City. Little did he know that it would start out with this matchless gifts, this tiny little, little teeny gift store <laughs> that he was given by Krishna. And then here they come. Here they come through the doors. And you're going to see that, oh, wow, are they going to come. They're going to come, 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 and there's going to, a lot will come because he had the simple prayer of opening a temple in New York City, and he didn't know how. He did not know how. It's when you start to think about the future and you start planning like you're some kind of a spiritual architect now and you've got to make, save the world by you know, building things and doing things and this and that. No, he's just going to stay there, keep the fire lit inside in the altar, and just let everything show itself. That's our first theme, living spontaneously and without a future.
Because if you're doing something for the purpose of the future, I will tell you, God is not the future. God is not in the future. God cannot be found in the future, ever. So, if we're going to put the name of God first, and we're going to really be sincere about what our true purpose is, then, then this is just an example. We're seeing an example today of one who, who is doing that, who did that. This is the Holy Spirit's gift, gift for us today. He's, he's saying, I want you to actually live the course. I'm not so interested in you being a theorist of the course. I'm not so interested in you teaching it conceptually. If you're not lit, that's what Generation Z and the Millennials call it, lit. Are you going to be lit with me? Lit. Learn the lingo of the new generation. The baby boomer, boomers are going out. They're, they're, they're getting washed away. But Gen Z, the Millennials are saying lit. And there's another word that they use, woke. <laughs> I'm asking you to be lit and woke. I'm hoping that they title, they put Gen Z or something and millennials in the title of this, this uh, video, if it ever makes it out, so we can have them light up like the ones that are walking into matchless gifts. <laughs> Meth, cocaine, marijuana, drugs, down and out. They have no jobs. They're wanderers. They're wanderers. And this is who the Holy Spirit and Krishna are sending as the first students. The drug heads. That's right. <laughs> he's starting out with the drug heads. How beautiful. Because he's, he's loving and accepting and he just welcomes them in. He doesn't, you know, he, he jokes. He said, oh, they're kind of uh, lost in, in uh, LSD. And they're welcome. <laughs> You know, he's not, he doesn't have a, a filter process. He has, he's cooking for him. He's cooking for him. <laughs> he's cooking for the ones that are coming there. Now, this is the Holy Spirit, and this is how Krishna works. <laughs> We're going to be chanting Hare Krishna before the end of this show, I tell you. Group of Course in Miracles students, Hare Krishna. I don't know, they'll say, oh God, what are they up to now? David and that crazy gang, and they're watching a Hare Krishna movie. That's right, we are. We need, we need help. We need demonstrations. We need, we need people to show us the way through demonstrations, not through con concepts and intellectual bantering. He's not, you notice he's not bantering intellectually. Well, I don't know about that. I think there's a... This is this. He's not even trying to force Lord Krishna on anybody. He's saying, chant the name of God, whatever, whatever that name is for you. You know the name of God and the address, chant it. Ah-ha-ha. Ah, ah. That's inclusive. That's not exclusive. That's inclusive. When you say, chant the name of God. And all he's saying is what Jesus is saying in the workbook in Lesson 183 and Lesson 184. He's basically saying... Focus on God. Focus on God. You know, Jesus even said, why do you call me good? In the Bible, God is good. Jesus was always, always, always pointing at God. Never at the person of Jesus. Even Messiah, he knew that that was a state of mind. He didn't say, this flesh and this guy with long hair is the Messiah. He would just speak the presence. The Holy Spirit would, would say, now your scriptures are fulfilled. He didn't even use the word Messiah. He would just go to the, with the rabbi, go into the, the synagogue, and then he would say the words that most people thought were the, the most blasphemous words that a Jewish man could ever utter. The scriptures are today fulfilled. They were ready to get rocks out, even in, in the synagogue. They, they turned furious when he said, the scriptures are fulfilled. But that was the Holy Spirit speaking. It wasn't a man speaking. The Messiah is not a male or a female. The Messiah is not masculine or feminine. It's the I am presence. It was saying, the scriptures are fulfilled. I am. Oh, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, here come the rocks again. They don't like that one either. That's like, oh, you're, 
You young, long-haired whippersnapper, how dare you? How dare you come along with your long hair and say, before Abraham was, I am. You are, that you do not honor the traditions. It was their way of saying, you're not honoring the past. And Jesus was like, that's right, I am. I am one with God. I and the Father are one. He was giving it straight. He was giving it true. And he's doing like the Swami is. He's just letting it come out. You know, He's not thinking whether it's going to be accepted or not. He's not thinking whether he's going to get tossed out of the synagogue or not. He's not concerned about outcomes. He's not concerned about consequences. And why would you be, if you are the I am presence prior to time, why would you be concerned with the reactions of time. <laughs> he was basically telling the world, the ego, you're not real, and I am. <laughs> yeah, that's good, that's good. There's no fear of consequences in that. So, here we go, let's watch our Swami. Now we're getting a little taste of what, what his past was like. His, his dad, what his dad was like, what, what his upbringing was like. We're getting a little bit of an idea of what's underneath that smile. <laughs> and there's a lot there. Now, I, some weeks ago I showed uh, Billy Graham. <laughs> and people were going, oh my God, he's showing Billy Graham and now he's showing the Swami of Hare Krishna's. Oh my gosh, it's, what's next? <laughs> But you notice the parallel with Billy Graham and our Swami. They both get in the newspaper. Billy Graham's out in preaching to a group in Los Angeles, and then here our Swami is in New York City, and he's chanting and drumming and happy, and people are dancing around him. And lo and behold, it's, they take a photograph, and they put the photograph in the New York Times, and, and they write an article. That's just the spirit. The Holy Spirit's just having some fun. You know, with Billy Graham, he starts out, he's like, he's a farm boy. He's a farm boy. He's milking cows in, on a farm in North Carolina. And the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, I'm calling you. I need you to do some work. Uh, and here we have a, a Swami for most people, we would say, when you're 70 years old, you know, spend time with your wife and your son, and if you have any grandchildren, you know, go out to pasture, like secretariat, like a horse. You run, you, you've run your race. You won your triple crown. Just sit, sit back at home with the family and enjoy your family. But the Holy Spirit wants to use us for the release of all time and space. You don't rest on some form situation. You need to let your light shine for the whole human race and for the, really the whole cosmos, all the galaxies. Shine your light so bright that the whole galaxy realizes that God is one, that God is real. That's, that is nothing short of your calling. That's what the calling is about. So. Far from just kind of saying, well, it's time for me to just sink into the, to the twilight years and just uh, enjoy the sunset and die, he comes to New York City and we can see it's not long after his little matchless gifts thing there that, and sending them out. Now they're in the park and there's lots of them and the New York Times is posting it. Boom! It's in front of millions. Boom. Effortlessly. And that's what happened with Billy Graham. One minute he's preaching, the next minute he, he gets put in the newspaper in a national kind of way, and it's gi a giant spotlight, and boom, it just expands. But that's the way the Holy Spirit works. This shouldn't be shocking. This shouldn't be shocking at all. This is just the way, when you answer the call, this is the way that it goes. It can't, it can't be hidden. It can't be restrained. It can't be held back in any way. It, it lights you up. It, it's, it, it's the reason for everything. It's the, 
It's the central purpose for everything. It doesn't have to compete against opposing interests because there are no opposing interests. God is, is the point of everything. And if you don't like the word God, then use spirit instead. If you don't like the word spirit, then use soul instead. You know, it goes by any name you want. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the creator. It's the, it's the, the one. It's the, the prime creator. That's what everything is about. So here we go. It's just been a very short time, and he's gone from uh, the little matchless gifts, and now he's out in the open in New York City. And now the city and the world is starting to hear a little bit about this, and maybe they never ever heard the word Krishna before. That's not surprising. You know, I remember I, I grew up in, and uh, it was a long time. It was a lot of years before I ever heard the word Krishna. Growing up in America, you know, this was not like in our history books. If I went to history, I'd hear who invaded who and who took over which country, and I kind of fall, fall asleep in history class. It's the same thing. Who, who conquered who? Who came next? Drama, drama, conquer, conquer. Next, 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 next. You know, it sounds like the Bible. Begat, 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 begat. You know, you can fall asleep if you're a, a, a reading this stuff. But we're getting, when we hear about Krishna, when we hear about the, the saints and the mystics, when we hear about the Vedas, the Vedas were not in my history book. <laughs> Nothing. It, India, my gosh, to read about India in an American history book, you know, it's like, oh my God, talk about skipping over what's really helpful and talking about nothing, much ado about nothing, and having to do exams and regurgitate back nothing, nothing. In Declaration of Independence, independence from who? From Great Britain. Is that supposed to be like something that will save your soul? That the United States broke away from Great Britain? You know, I don't actually feel like that really has a lot of importance in the big scheme of things. But we did need to open our minds to be shown what is valuable. And in the end, start to realize our, our spirit is what's valuable. It's always been what's valuable. Okay, here we go. Back to the, the chanting in, in the park. So here we've got it. Even though his father never wished for him to earn money for work, he is a flourishing pharmacist in India. You know, what can you say? The ego is, is strong, you know. He's got a wife, a child. Did you see the look on that child's face too? Oh, there's some strong, <laughs> strong feelings come that little boy. But he's a, he has a flourishing business. Now he's a successful businessman. He's a husband. He, he has a child. And then the guru of his heart, this man, it looks, looks like Ken Wilbur is the reincarnation of <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Roll it back, Ken, back to what's really important, self-realization. You know, it says, you really need to teach English people. I mean, this is coming from spirit in the sense that more and more people are learning English in the world, industrialized nations, in a world of materialism run amok. <laughs> How better to rein everybody back into the glory of God but to preach the message, to speak it. Of course, we have to demonstrate it because the words don't matter. If you preach something that you don't live, then it's just another theology, it's just more words. We don't need more words. We don't even need another theology. We just need the presence of God's love and to, to experience God's love in our heart. That's all that's required. But this, he's got the letter, and now the instructions have been given. Is It's planting a seed in his heart. This is what my guru wants of me. 
And this is a guru who's been in a tradition of 5,000 years of lineage, of devotion to God. And this is what he's instructing me, a student, to do, to preach, to preach these uh, to, to the English, to the English speaking. And, and obviously growing up in India, he, he had learned English. So it, it's not like saying, preach something that you aren't capable of doing. He's just pointing the direction for his life. And this is very much how it went with Paramahansa Yogananda. He was very, very, very dedicated to his guru. who He wanted to meet him for so long and then he was walking down the street one day and he happened to look down a kind of a narrow alley and he saw him because he had seen an image of him in his mind and there he was. And then as soon as he, Paramahansa, met his uh, guru, then, then he gave his life uh, in service and devotion. He didn't mess around. He didn't, he didn't dilly-dally. He didn't delay. And, and you can feel that. That's part of this uh, deep Indian culture. You know, when the way is made clear, follow it. Go for it. Don't hesitate. Don't delay. Don't be distracted. Go for it when it's presented. And he, he was there, he was drawn to Gandhi and everything, but Gandhi was still, you know, trying to get the British out. There was still a political aspect, but when he, he meets his guru, the guru says, it's about self-realization. And self-realization is not political. Self-realization has nothing whatsoever to do with politics. I'm, not, I'm talking politics of your family. I'm talking politics of your church or your synagogue or your ashram. I'm talking politics of the country you live in. Politics doesn't meet with self-realization. You have to know who you are, which is an eternal spiritual being, and you have to forgive or release everything else. Not get caught in the ego's thoughts and false actions and false uh, pursuits and false goals, but to l turn away from them and realize their nothingness and, and devote yourself to being the living presence of God. That's what self-realization is. If God created you perfect and God created you as a divine self, then to know thyself, in the Greek sense, is to know, in Course in Miracles terms, to know your Christ nature. And there's nothing else of any importance. Nothing. Nothing at all besides that. So we're seeing it acted out in, in his, his uh, life, in the sense that, that he said he would have joined with his guru, but he was married. He, he had a child. He was in the householder phase, is what they call it in India. He was in the householder phase. And they all, if you know anything about Indian philosophy and spiritual awakening, the householder phase is a temporary phase that you pass through. It is not an end point. <laughs> and Jesus tells us miracles are the means and... Spiritual awakening is, is the end. Revelation. Miracles is the mean, revelation is the end. Revelation is direct contact with, with God. So, it doesn't matter which culture you use, which philosophies you use, you can find examples of this all out throughout history. It's you find what you're looking for. And, and clearly, this is a point where we're seeing his guru there, that's the, the picture of him. He's a little bit older there with his white beard and his glasses, but, but basically he's giving the instructions now. And that instruction is going in the Swami's heart. You know, that, it's like, it's like in, when you have a time release capsule, this is a, a purpose release seed in the heart. And there will come a time when that seed will activate. And then, of course, you have no choice but to follow it. Once it activates, there, there is no other option. 
<laughs> you gotta love how the spirit works. Allen Ginsberg goes on a, a show called Firing Line <laughs> and he brings his instrument and he starts chanting Hare Krishna. And then you can see the look on Will, William F. Buckley's face like, what the hell? What the hell is happening to me? You know, this is a, a, a show for dis intellectual discourse. <laughs> And this is how the spirit works. He, Allen Ginsberg brings a, a, a little simple instrument that he can move uh, to bring the air through it, and then he starts starts chanting in in humbleness, in joy, in humility. And William F. Buckley just gets a smile because he cannot believe it. It's probably like when they first jumped out onto the streets and started chanting and singing with New Yorkers probably going, what the hell? What is going, what is going on? But, but this is what it takes. It just takes a spark in your heart to be inspired. And I'm not talking about personal inspiration. I, I just gave a talk this last week on prayer, really dispelling personal insp inspiration because if you put personal in front of the inspiration, then it means ego motive, personal inspiration. It can be a starting point. If you feel like you're, you're, uh, you know, you're dead, <laughs> if you feel like you've come to life's end and life has no purpose and no value and no meaning, then you might get a thought of, of something that seems to involve the personality self but you feel a, a little fresh breeze blowing in there. That's the Holy Spirit just making contact. But like I talked about in the prayer talk, you have to give it all over. You can't, you can't say to God, make me a better person when God didn't make you a person in the first place. Why would God want to make you a better person if he, he never created you as a body? <laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever. You have to be willing to give it all over and say, now you know the way. That's how the, the workbook ends. You know, Father, we, we do not know the way to you, but you have called and we have answered. Salvation's ways are not our own. This is the key of all mind training in A Course in Miracles, that you can say, I do not know the way, but there is one who does know the way. And that's why I will follow and you will lead. <laughs> that's why, Holy Spirit, you are in the lead. You will use time and space to unwind me from this ego belief. If I believe I'm a person, how is a person going to unwind from something that it already believes it is? You know, it's, there's no way. Gandhi had a good phrase for that. He said, Blind, the blind leading the blind, and they all fall in the ditch. <laughs> Gandhi, what a great dis graphic description. The blind leading the blind, and they all fall in the ditch. They're all lost. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. So, so you need the blind following the one who can see, the one with Christ vision or Krishna presence. You, you have to follow the, the spirit in order to do that. That's why Jesus is a workbook lesson. I will step back and let him lead the way. Yeah, it's totally the, the way is you have to surrender it all. But we're seeing here, even in this interview, that somehow Allen Ginsberg was swept up by a presence that he dared to go on firing line <laughs> and start playing that instrument and singing Hare, chanting Hare Krishna. Yeah, that's like you going into an interview or a job interview and start singing and dancing uh, and praising the Lord Jesus. Uh, I don't know that would help you get hired, but what do you want to be hired for? You've already been hired by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's your boss. <laughs> that's your boss, I'll tell you. And that's the one who can orchestrate time and space to meet your perceived needs while you're waking up to your Christ self, you know, that's, that's why the Holy Spirit is ultimately the, the inspiration. And in this terms of this movie, Krishna, 
you can see there's a very, very deep devotion to Krishna. So he comes over in 1965 and he has not a penny. He's a homeless man. And, and then one year later, I mean, Bill and Helen are just beginning to get cranking with the course. And one year later, he's establishing an international Krishna consciousness organization. I mean, Helen and Bill would have peed in their pants if they had any idea what this Swami was doing in New York City at the time. I mean, they, were, they had their resistances, especially Helen, to taking down these words from Jesus. But you can only see down the street <laughs> in matchless gifts, something's cooking <laughs> in there. Because one year later, he's forming an international consciousness, Krishna consciousness uh, society. And then, there he is in his tiny, tiny little apartment with his little altar like he had when he was a little boy and doing his worship and he's got a globe there. So he takes the globe in to meet with the 12 teenagers, lest I say teenagers, who have probably come off of whatever, their own lives, world travels, drugs, whatever, they've seen something <laughs> in him. And then he starts saying, you to Russia, you to Japan. You, you just have to feel the faith of that. I mean, I, I have met with teenagers, but, but usually we were talking about other things other than me sending them <laughs> to a country. <laughs> Fifteen years old, go, go to Russia and preach A Course in Miracles. Go to Japan. <laughs> You're 17, yes, go. Form a temple in Japan and preach the Course in Miracles. You can just imagine. You can just imagine what this is. Because they're teenagers, they are not like students that have been with him for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. These are teenagers that are meeting with him in a storefront of a gift shop that's called Matchless Gifts in New York City. And he's already... You feel that's the spirit starting to come through him when he's telling these teenagers they're going to be going to different countries. And actually, that's just a premonition. That's exactly what's coming. <laughs> Everyone may say, well, it, that's like pie in the sky thinking. Like this guy's off his rocker. If he thinks these teenagers are actually going to go to London, to Moscow, you know, to Tokyo and everything and start chanting and dancing and forming temples in cities where they've never been before. Well, look at his, his example. He did the same thing. He went to New York City without a penny and just wandered the streets, even during the cold times like winter. And, and he's not asking them to do anything different than he's done already. That's another characteristic of spirit. Spirit's never going to ask anybody to do something that you haven't done yourself. You need to be the living, breathing example of what you ask anyone else to do. Because why would they follow you? Why would, these, why would the teenagers even consider going to different countries unless their Swami had done exactly the same thing. And in their mind, they're thinking, well, he did it. Perhaps I could do it as well. So that's what makes it such a joyful adventure. You know, it's not like you have future goals and you tick them off when you achieve them. You don't really know what will be asked of you, but you do know that whatever it is, it's to help you wake up to forgive the world and to heal. And there's nothing more important than forgiving the world and waking up to truth, to reality. So that, I mean, wow, what a spot in the movie. Spinning his little globe, pointing, and then telling them by name where they're going to be going. And you can feel the, the, the sincerity and the presence behind that. At, and we're learning a great lesson there. Don't ask somebody to do something that you haven't already done yourself. Because if you do, that would just be hypocrisy. 
And, and somebody may respond, why? <laughs> why should I follow what you're saying? Because if you haven't done it yourself, then, then what, why should they follow <laughs> what you're doing? That's what I think he loved about his, his guru, because he felt his guru was, had, had done it, had, had talked for years and years about self-realization because he was speaking from a state of mind. And therefore he followed the instructions of his, his guru. But it's like practice, practicing the presence leads to experiencing the presence. And then once you're in the presence, then these kind of things come through from the presence. It's coming from God, it's coming from the Holy Spirit, it's not coming from a possibility. <laughs> it's like an instruction coming from the presence of God. And that you would want to follow. If God was speaking to you through someone or speaking to you through their, their presence, you would want to say, yes, yes, I'll do that, I'll follow that. That's what happens when you send teenagers into London with nothing, <laughs> with nothing. And then the spirit takes it from there, you know. The, and you may say, wow, that's interesting guidance. Um, shaving your heads, wrapping yourself in sheets, and then and putting on yellow. And then going out and chanting and singing, and then <laughs> taking food to Apple Records, <laughs> food and books. You know, you know this is not choreographed by a human being. I mean, who could come up with this? And then, after you keep taking books and food to Apple Records, you walk in one day and there's George. And George is not casually interested, he's listening to the record almost every day. <laughs> and George is, is touched and inspired. And what happens when you have a beetle that's touched, inspired by what you're sharing? Boom! Again, like New York Times. <laughs> There's another boom. <laughs> it's a fireworks show. This is not something you would naturally expect from a, from a group of teenagers going to London, because London is a big, big metropolis. And these teenagers show up and they follow their internal instructions and then they send back the headlines of a newspaper to uh, their Swami. And he just gets the biggest smile on his face not a smile of surprise, he sent them there. He sent them there. He sent the teenagers to London. And then they sent back the, the headline in the newspaper. You see, that is the spirit. There, you, can't, you can't go to them and say, what was your business plan? They had no business plan. You can't say, what was your plan of action? They had no plan of action. <laughs> In fact, if you'd have written up a plan of action and said, we plan to take food and books to Apple Records and have George Harrison record an album with us and, and sell 70,000 uh, songs on the first day, people would laugh. They go, yeah, what are you smoking? What what drug are you on? You see, this, that's how far beyond imagination and expectations of the human being as the plan is. What did our prophet John Lennon tell us? Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. <laughs> while the ego is making its plans for the future. Oh, life is going to happen to you. Oh, spirit will find a way to reach your heart. Oh, the joy of God will come streaming, beaming through while you're busy making other plans that are based on the past. And these 
unfoldings, we'll call them, are still the past, but it's the Spirit's use of the past. This is the Holy Spirit's use of symbols. This is Jesus' use of symbols. This is Krishna's use of symbols. They're definitely it's having some fun. You know, chanting and singing and everything, you know, there's got to be some fun in this. And, and you think, George was probably just drawn to the, the attitude, the atmosphere, and so were all the employees in Apple Records when they all joined in the chant. You know, that has to come from within. The employees are not going to just jump on it for the sake of, of something in form. They, they were inspired. This is a, the way the Spirit inspires. How relaxing for us to, to know that the Spirit's got us, that all we have to do is stay present in the moment, and that's it. Show up in the moment. It can't be that difficult. In fact, it's not. It's easy. It's easy to show up in the moment. It's difficult to try to plan out a, a linear life with all of the concerns and dramas and responsibilities, ego responsibilities that are part of this egoic world. And when you start to trust and let the Spirit light your heart up, then that's it. You know, look at uh, Prabhupada. So I can't even say his name, but Prabhupada. I think there's kind of saying is the way they pronounce it. But it's fun to see how he's so clueless and happy, and then he just keeps watching the witnesses of, of happiness popping up everywhere. Okay. Now we're on undoing the doer by being done through. That's right. He's active all day, writing, answering questions, talking to people, living his life during the day, and then maybe around midnight until two, until three or four in the morning, he, he shifts gears into translations on top of the day. So that's clearly undoing the doer by being done through. That's, that's one of the best examples you can have of that. That Jesus says in his Course in Miracles, he says, rest does not come from sleeping, but from waking. <laughs> oh, that flips the whole human perception and definition of fatigue. Rest does not come from sleeping, but from waking. Rest your mind by your function. Workbook lesson, my happiness and my function are one. It's his function that gives him the energy. In the East they call it like the prana energy. Uh, when Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, uh, he, would, he would be up and teaching and sharing and praying all day and then it says in the Bible that some of the apostles got a little concerned because he was teaching and he was interacting with the public all day long, and they would notice that he wouldn't eat. And that was of great concern to the apostles. And, and his reply was, don't you know I have mana from above? So in the Indian tradition it's called prana, Jesus called it mana. It's an inner energy of being in alignment with God. That's what prana and mana means. It's you you are sustained by the love of God. That's workbook lesson number 50 in A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, you believe you're sustained by everything but God. Pills, money, protective clothing, being liked, knowing the right people. You see, psychologically, physically, it doesn't matter. I, I am sustained by the love of God. And, and we're seeing this demonstrated here with the Swami because he has this endless amount of, of energy that is being channeled through, and this is a good example of being done through. Uh, Yogananda is, is also another good example uh, where he's out there and he's, he's in form. He seems to be getting up in years, up in years, and then 
toward the end of his life, he's surrounded by these beautiful devotees, monks, and he just gets on a writing spree. He just starts dictating and writing and writing and writing, very much like the Swami here, where he, he has his purpose. And uh, even though when he suffered when he suffered the heart attack and he went back to his beloved place to, he thought to die, it was far from it. <laughs> he probably got back there and he said, okay, Krishna, I've done what you've asked. Uh, now it's time for me to go. And probably Krishna said, just beginning, my son. <laughs> just beginning. <laughs> and then he comes smiling out of the the airport, uh, you know, the, the tunnel from the plane, smiling and dancing and, and chanting. He looked really fired up when he came back from India because he had a purpose. He was not sent just for one purpose, but it, it ended up being the, the fuller extension of the same purpose. And that was a very devoted life, being done through. And Jesus talks about this in the Course. He says the only function of the body is to let the voice for God speak through it. He says it in some places, he calls it communication is the Holy Spirit, only function the Holy Spirit sees for the body. Well, that, that starts to simplify it for it. If it's just for communication, then I don't need to bother about trying to assign other purposes for the body. I can start to just say, oh, okay, if that's the way it is, then I will give my everything over to that. And here we have, that is, that is the example. Undoing the doer by being done through. Some of you who are with me through the Billy Graham documentary, you, again, you're seeing some parallels. <laughs> Billy Graham, when he first went to uh, Moscow, first went to Russia, you know, he just had a quiet time looking at the structures and going to the big stadium to just pray silently uh, that, the, that the love could be extended and the, the gift could be accepted. And, and here we have uh, Prabhupada with the same thing, going there, <laughs> he may be a little bit <laughs> different from Billy Graham, although, I don't know, they might have, if Billy Graham had traveled with a Bible, they might have confiscated that, but they confiscated uh, Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, and they said, oh, it's okay, not a serious offense, uh, you, no concentration camp for you. <laughs> and so, he goes, he goes off, and he has a very similar experience, just gazing at the churches, noticing that there aren't people uh, going in and out, not seeing the, the, the vibrancy, the dancing, the joy that he is used to experiencing uh, in his life in India and in New York and uh, also in San Francisco area. So, so the, he's experiencing witnesses of joy and, and love and laughter, but, but still there's that part that wants to go to extend it. And just like with Billy Graham, you know, it seemed to take him a while, but he got, he got a, a, a visa, he got a, a way to go there, and so did Billy Graham. And this is where, you know, you start to realize that Jesus mentions in A Course in Miracles, in the Manual for Teachers, he, he, he gives ten characteristics of a teacher of God. And he says, the first one is trust, and all the rest depend on the trust. But interestingly enough, the tenth characteristic of a teacher of God, it says the last one, usually the last one to come into uh, fruition, is open-mindedness. And now you see where Billy Graham and Prabhupada are the same. <laughs> you can start to see the similarities. Now, you know, everyone likes to break religion up into different theologies 
And of course, you know, even with uh, even with the teachings and the theologies that Prabhupada is sharing, you know, about still creation and the personality head of Krishna and so on and so forth, you know, I could talk about all those things and and yet when he was on the talk show, he was asked the question with the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita and all the different scriptures and all the different prophets and, and teachers, don't you see that there's many contradictions? And he said, no, I, I don't see that there are contradictions because it's the same goal. God is the goal. That's very important. And I think that's the one thing that you can experience that opens you up from a life of trust all the way to what Jesus calls open-mindedness. If God is the goal and everyone is really, regardless of what they're saying, regardless of what they're doing, regardless of what they believe, God is the goal and God is the focus. And once you can just come to that one understanding then you open into open-mindedness. Then it's not, you know, is that Course in Miracles related or Bhagavad Gita related? Is it Bible related? You know, is it Quran related? Who really cares? Who really cares if God is the goal? If everyone you meet or even think of is all part of one thing, God is the goal, then you can start to let go of any idea of differences. And then, then you can start to feel the grace, the blessing of it. And I really like that, like Prabhupada, he got to travel eventually after, after George Harrison released <laughs> My Sweet Lord, then boom, 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 again, now it's, it's worldwide and he's just accepting invitations. And I've enjoyed traveling to 44 countries because it's like you get to meet yourself over and over and over. You get to rejoice with your brothers and sisters in the goal, God, in the one goal. There's only one goal. There aren't different goals. God is, is everything and, and God is happiness. And God is the love and joy and peace. It's an experience. It's an experience. It's not a theology. And Jesus even mentions that in the Course. You know, he, in, in his workbook, he says, forget this world, forget this Course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. He says, forget this Course. He's saying that, that the Course in Miracles is just a theology that is meant to lead you into an experience. And he wants you to forget the Course. He doesn't want you to cling to words and cling to verses and cling to scriptures and quoting things. He wants you to actually reach a state of mind where you're open-minded and you just love and you welcome everything and everyone because the goal is God. That's what Prabhupada is saying. You know, he's saying the goal is God. And you can see, then it starts to be humorous. You know, you, your Hare Krishna movement is now in a Woody Allen movie. You're now, your Hare Krishna move, movement is in a, a comedy skit. Uh, it's, it's in songs. It's in everything. And is that important? Not in and of itself, but just the lightness and laughter and joy of of God's love is what it's all about. So then you don't have to waste your time and your mind's energy in looking for differences. You don't have to say to somebody, I, I agree with most of what you're saying, but let's just drop off the but. <laughs> and let's drop off the most too. And just come into that state of agreement, ah, God is the goal. We're the same one. We're the same spirit. We don't have to split hairs over theology. God is not some watching us from a distance wondering if we get it scholastically right. 
We are not asked to be scholars for God. We're actually asked to be happy. <laughs> he, wants us, he wants us to be happy. He wants us to feel the love and the joy and the peace, not to keep hypothesizing about the theory. We don't need to theorize. Even quantum physics, you know, if, if, if a quantum physicist was given the choice between getting their science right or eternal happiness, you know they would choose <laughs> eternal happiness over getting it right. <laughs> getting the theory right, getting the equation right, you know. Even a scientist would be willing to drop the mask of scientist for the joy of being one with God. Because, because God is the goal, even of science. God is the goal of science. God is the goal of mathematics or sacred geometry. God is the goal of, of anything you can think of. Even culinary, even people who love to cook and bake. God is the goal of all culinary skills and abilities. God is the goal. So we're just beautifully seeing that acted out here by the Swami, you know. He's, he's showing us by his attitude, by his laughter, by his smile, he's, he's, he's teaching, he's symbolizing, he's witnessing the greatest lesson, the greatest lesson that there is, and that, that, that God is the goal. And then Jesus says, God takes the final step. Whoa, that must be fun. Uh, that means that you as a person don't have to take the final step. <laughs> God takes, God takes the final step. It can't get any easier than that. God takes the final step. It's like saying, who's going to take my final exam in this uh, human equation? Well, God takes the final step. So it just means you have the willingness in your heart to open up to that happiness. That's all it means. It's, that's where your, uh, your focus is. Okay, there we go. Very good. So, if we use some Course in Miracles terms to kind of uh, bring it all together, that, that uh, what is called Krishna consciousness, we could call, it's like a, a unified consciousness or unified awareness. Uh, the terms that Course in Miracles uses, Jesus calls it the happy dream, the real world, uh, he calls, calls it uh, healed perception. And Jesus goes further to say that, that perception and learning are identical. I see Jason Kim there. We just did a, a beautiful uh, online uh, gathering with a lot of our friends from uh, Brazil. And um, that's one of the areas that Jason brought up from the Manual for Teachers uh, and the stages of development of trust was that the line that, that, that perception and learning are identical. And this is because there is no subject and object in consciousness. That would be duality, to have a subject and an object, a perceiver and a perceived an observer and an observed. So the highest teaching of all religions, of all theologies, points to an experience of unified consciousness. And, you know, I, I like Jesus calling it a happy dream. The reason it's happy is because there's no split, there's no judgment with consciousness. So Jesus tells us in the Course that consciousness is the domain of the ego and consciousness can be trained. So that's what seems to be called mind training in A Course in Miracles. That's what all the, the Vedas were pointing to. Uh, we heard uh, Prabhupada call it um, mind control, controlling the mind. And what he meant by that was training the mind to see no differences. Training the mind to see that we are all the same one and that differences are of the ego. They, they don't have a, a reality. They don't have a, 
a, a, there's no truth in differences. We are the same, not separate. We are the same, not different. Sameness is real. And, and that is the unified consciousness that this movie is calling Krishna Consciousness. It goes by many names in many traditions. Whatever name you feel comfortable with is great, but the key is unified, singular, one. And that's why there's only one dream, because there's only one dreamer. And the, the dream and the dreamer are one. The dreamer is not separate from the dream. So when you look at the world, you are seeing consciousness. <laughs> if you look at the world and you say, I don't like that guy or I don't like that woman, that's just uh, an attempt to see something outside of mind and it's not there. <laughs> Jesus is telling us there's nothing apart from the mind. Ideas leave not their source and, and once you see that everything that you perceive is your mind, is your consciousness, then, then in that sense God can take the final step, which goes beyond consciousness altogether, altogether just into abstract light. But the focus is always watching your mind and noticing if you have a reaction to something that you believe is not you. It's real simple. If everything is you, and you believe there's something that's not you, that's the mistake. <laughs> that's the error, <laughs> is believing there's something outside of your mind, outside of consciousness. So these are deep teachings, and uh, I have to say I've been, I was really honored to uh, read through the Bhagavad Gita. I was really honored to study the Vedas. I could see the the parallels, the sameness of the teachings of A Course in Miracles with the Vedas. I loved it when Gandhi would talk, refer to the Bhagavad Gita and a life beyond the senses, uh, like Jesus does in the Course. And you start to realize that it's really quite simple. It's, it's not a complex thing at all. To, to realize that you are one with everything is is actually the only thing that you can realize. Everything else is, is impossible. But that one realization of everything being connected and unified. Even the quantum physicists talk about the quantum field. That's it. The quantum field and Krishna consciousness are the same. <laughs> The happy dream and the quantum field and Krishna consciousness are the same. Everything in that awareness is the same. Because that's what healing is. So don't be so concerned about healing the body. It's the, it's the mind and it's consciousness that has to be recognized as, as unified. That, that is the, is the happiness. That is the joy. So I hope you have enjoyed this trip. Uh, what a ride. We got, we got taken all around the world and back to ancient India and whew, yeah, we're, we're getting a good taste of the, the Bhagavad Gita and, and Krishna today, which is really a nice group of notes to play on our piano. Uh, Sometimes people say, well, how does, this, how does the Bhagavad Gita fit with the Holy Bible and everything? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's, they've all got some beautiful things. I, I think the thing that stands out about the Old Testament from the Bible is there's a line that says, God has no favorites. <laughs> well, that kind of fits with there's only one goal. <laughs> uh, God has no favorites. And then, of course, uh, Jesus, with the Course, does a good job of reinterpreting some of those things from the Bible that were a little misunderstood, like the Chosen Ones. Uh, Jesus says, all are called, few choose to listen. <laughs> so he 
takes something like the chosen one and he turns it around and says, ah, all are called, but few choose to listen. So again, the goal is God. So all we're doing is we're saying yes to listening. Lead me, guide me, show me the way, and uh, let me feel the joy of knowing your love. So we, we have a, had a beautiful uh, day. I like with these symbols. Uh, yeah, when we go from uh, Billy Graham to, uh, to the Swami, you know, we're covering the gamut. When you go from the Hare Krishnas to, to evangelism, you know, you can put everything else in between there and we can, we got all the bases covered with the Spirit showing us how all-inclusive God's love is and anything can be used by the Holy Spirit to point the way to our, our eternal happiness. So, as usual, I really enjoy these one-to-one uh, -one interactions we can have here for the blessing of everyone, and I know all of you enjoy them too because it's beautiful to hear all of our brothers and sisters from around the world talking from their heart and sharing uh, from the love that they feel. So, Pete, I see we have one hand. I see Deborah over there in, in Spain is joining us today. <laughs> Hi, yeah, Deborah. We've just put the instructions in the chat here on how people can raise their digital hand. Please speak slowly for our translators. And uh, Deborah, yep, I'll just unmute you now. You can unmute yourself. Hi, David. Hi, Deborah. Oh, I love you so much. <laughs> what a movie. <laughs> All this joy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, it was so joyful. And I really like all the symbols of the music and your Harrison. And yeah, everything. It was really beautiful. And also, well, as I was sharing in the in the smaller group, I was just feeling like, yeah, like everything is for God. And like even what I'm going through is for God. And when I went through, it was for God. Like it's just everything. And yeah, I I also I'm having like all these thoughts about different places and just like yeah, like and I was just feeling, yeah, my heart is what wherever God wants me to be and but also I, I don't know I'm just so like confused because like if there's like so many thoughts like that yeah, just stay when you're in Spain or uh, also I have like these joyful thoughts of yeah go to Mexico or, or and also I have like these thoughts like um like I, 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 I would love also to go to Bolivia for some some time just to like I really want my family to know them that I really love them. Like it doesn't matter if they don't understand me, but I just want to let them know that <laughs> I love them with all my heart. And and also, yeah, all, all, like this whole week, I was just feeling like I have, like there's so much, like something is going on, like in my chest and on my throat. It's not like I feel sick or anything at all. But it's just like I feel this strong and sometimes it's so uncomfortable. It's like like a rock and sometimes it's just like so much energy. And and I don't know really what it is because I'm just I just I already share everything that I was supposed to share, you know, and and I I don't know, it's just yeah, kind of like uncomfortable. Yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sometimes the, the energy can be so strong and yet it's so different than what we're used to. And uh, in that sense, it's, we judge it sometimes as being uncomfortable. And sometimes people have like huge heart opening and, and a huge energy experience with that. But, but there's a, a sense of, wow, it, it it's overwhelming, or I, it's, I can't contain it, and those kind of thoughts. So, so like you said, the realization is, is uh, God is right with you always what, with whatever you're going through. And then 
that allows you the permission to just relax a bit because the, the ego part always wants to judge something uh, is positive or negative or something's going right or something's going wrong. And it's always judging one, one experience as to the next um, with a fear, like a fear of where this is all heading. So uh, I think you can just know for sure you're in your heart that, that you have the love to give away and the love that you feel for your family and the love that you want to express. I know you enjoy like expressing and dancing and wow, what a, a movie today. We saw lots of dancing, dancing in the streets, uh, dancing everywhere. Uh, that, that's a beautiful symbol of just allowance. That, that that's part of the, the pathway. Uh, in the Middle East, they have the whirling dervishes that, that literally twirl and spin for the love of God. And so it just shows that it, the expressions can come in so many ways. And then you can just relax and know that, that whatever you're given, whatever seed is in your heart, will just come to pass. Uh, like with the Swami, you know, he, he had his guru uh, before he passed away say, I'm, I want you to go and, and share with English people, English speaking people. And that was his final wish. And then in 1936, he passes away. And then it's not too long after that, that, that eventually that seed comes to the point where he goes, even at 70 years old, and everything is just amazing. Everything unfolds in perfect timing. So that's the, that's the comforting thought. You can just remind yourself, I have all this love to share. I have this love in my heart, but everything will be shared in perfect timing. And that uh, spirit is in charge of that. Yeah, spirit is in charge. <laughs> so it's beautiful. So thank you. Thank you for sharing with all of us. We feel it. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Deborah. We could go to uh, Jason Kim next. You can unmute there. Hey, everybody. Great to be here with you all um, on this journey. I love it. Uh, watching this movie, I mean, I. I literally decided to to sign up for this while you I was watching your introduction on YouTube because as soon as soon as I saw what the movie was about I was like yes I'm I got to I got to watch this you know I got to watch this um because I I just love India and their tra their cultural tra traditions that's where Hinduism uh came from and and Buddhism and and um I'm not sure about Sufism. I think that might be somewhere in the Middle East, but all these non-dual practices. And, and that's what I love about this, this course is it is about inclusion, not exclusion. And really just invite, just inviting everybody to participate regardless of their beliefs and just extending the love, you know? So I really want, you know, I'm, I'm not that far. I'm one of your slower turtles. Um, so I'm kind of like going, <laughs> I'm not, apparently I'm just like, I just want to make sure that I have time to do the lessons properly before I do even start a lesson sometimes, or I'll do half the, what's suggested, and then I'll just repeat it the next day. And, um, but I'm not too concerned about that. But what I keep hearing over and over, the message I keep getting is letting go and trusting in spirit and not uh, pursuing anything of this world. And I'm thinking to myself, there's a lot of fear attached to that for me because I don't know. And, and, <laughs> and, and even that has an answer from the non-dual teachers like Eckhart Tolle, you know, being at ease with not knowing is crucial for answers to come to you. And I'm like, oh, okay, so I have to be comfortable not knowing. But I still have this uh, reflex almost like I, I need to 
just in case as a backup, I need to take this database course in, in, at the college, just as a backup, even though I really don't want to do it, but I can do it. Um, and as a backup, just in case I need an income soon, uh, eventually, <laughs> hopefully. I don't know. I don't know what spirit has as in, in, in store for me, but when I, I've only been to the Hare Krishna uh, thing. I, was, I went to graduate school at University of Florida in Gainesville. And I remember somebody told, telling us, um, yeah, it's only like a dollar or two or something for lunch. And so we went there and we went up this ladder and it was, the ceiling was probably only about, I want to say about six feet, seven feet. It was, it wasn't that high and it felt so cozy and everybody was sitting on cushions and we were eating this vegetarian dish that was delicious. And I'm like, God, this is great. I love it. And then um, I never knew who that guy was uh, probably. Uh, I wrote it down, but I forgot his name. And I just want to be, I think the community is what inspired me mo most about this movie that, especially when they went to India and that you saw them singing through the streets and you're just like, that brought me to the present moment. Watching that brought me to the present moment, even though it was a recording, even though it was uh, on the order of linear time, it's happened in the past. It helps me to, to see joy because when I see joy, it inspires me to feel joy. And that can only be done in the present moment. So I don't know. I'm just, I don't know if I have a question, but maybe dealing with practical issues um, with livelihood. While I would love to just give everything away, but there's a lot of fear involved there. So that's my question. Thank you, David. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Well, the, our number one theme was living spontaneously and without a future. And, and certainly the Swami showed us that uh, in a very strong way. And um, yeah, just recently uh, on Thursday, you were the host for me on, the, on a podcast. And for the rest of them, I'll let them, I'll let them know the name of the podcast walking on water and going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> now that, you know, if you're, if you're just accepting invitations and you're hosting <laughs> that kind of a podcast. And also you said during the podcast that Macau had, had just sent you an invitation. And that's how you came to discover uh, uh, what we're doing with living miracles. So it's, it's just like the movie where things he went because he felt a seed and something in his heart that was calling him. He went with it, even though he didn't seem to have money or contacts or all the backups, uh, the things that you're supposed to have to, to take a voyage like that and, and undertake uh, such a calling. And then everything showed up effortlessly uh, for him in the most wondrous ways. And I think that you can take heart from that in the sense that, you know, you're just taking it moment by moment and day by day. And of course, there's two voices in the mind. One is, is the voice of the linear time. And it's like, what are you going to fall back on? How are you going to survive? How are you going to pay this off? How are you going to pay that? Uh, that voice is quite in, incessant, uh, very, very persistent. And then you have the voice that's calling you calmly saying, just trust, uh, the way will be shown, uh, the steps will be given, um, just take what's right in front of you right now, don't, don't try to look too far into the future. And I see that that's really where it comes down to, what, what will I trust, what, uh, what voice? Uh, with two competing voices, seemingly, and which voice will I follow? But I do feel like that's, even today, do you just watching the setup and feeling like, oh, I know I, I need to join in there. There's another just moment by moment, what feels is dropping on your heart, what's, what feels strong? And there it goes. That's, that's what living spontaneously is. 
and without a future. And it's a bit odd or strange at first because the, the previous conditioning would seem to be going in another direction. So I know at the beginning for me, um, when I was just beginning to study the course like you've been doing, um, I would have these heart opening experiences, I would have things really resonating, and yet I did have that other voice saying, great, great, read your book, uh, enjoy your little meditations, uh, you're going to have to come back to uh, the world here sooner or later, so don't, don't kid yourself, it was just chirping away pretty strong at the beginning. And then when I would give myself more permission to just relax and flow with what was given, oh my gosh, it got even more expansive and more heart opening. And eventually the other voice just had to just fade away a bit because uh, it wasn't giving being given any airtime. <laughs> It was it was getting it was getting edged out, <laughs> uh, and the and the spirit was was really starting to expand and the light in my mind. So I think you're on the right track, and I'm glad if this movie had some beautiful symbols of uh, of the ancient Indian traditions because I I know there's always warmed my heart too. So. I even had a friend today, as just as I was preparing to come over, she WhatsApped me, and it's my friend uh, Rachana from from New Delhi, from Delhi, India. And she wrote to me right before I came over, so I, I quickly told her what I was up to today uh, because of the the perfect synchronicity. So, so we're right there with you, Jason. We love you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, have your camera on if you want to share. And uh, we can go to Esther next. You can unmute there. Fabulous movie, David. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, what came up for me was after the movie and during the break, um, the mind was coming up with all these problems. And I had a chat with Alan and we we really went down the rabbit hole. He was saying that the mind is advertising and I just have to see that I'm never upset for the reason I think. And in doing that, I'm the, um, the interest in, in what the mind is saying will be lost because I'm seeing that the one that's upset um, isn't there and that the, um, I'm trying to think of all the things he said, it was so cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that it was, it's just like the, um, the feeling that there's there's there are these problems and that like for me the one of them was um what's it going to be like when i get the uh injection of the medication that i take on monday and um just seeing that i'm not upset for that reason that the mind is saying and there's freedom in that. There's, there's so much freedom because the story isn't true. And the feelings are associated with those thoughts are convincing something that it's correct in its, its assessment of the um the problem so to speak but the prayer is still one problem one solution and that that one solution would solve all the problems and so there's this dedication to to live that 
that's <laughs> it. That's it. All you're really asking for is like, you just want those reminders. And, and it's like a, a way of just reminding yourself to let go of those uh, problem thoughts. And I have a friend years ago, his name is Thomas Dunn, D-U-N-N, and he was a musician and a singer, and he took a lot of Course in Miracles lessons, and he put together an album called Course Chants. So the Hare Krishnas have their chants, and we have Course Chants. And, and I'm, when you were just speaking, I was thinking of a course chant that I used, to, I used to love and listen to a lot, but I'll give it to you so you can have it in your mind today. You, and you can share it with Alan, too. Do I want the problem or do I want the answer? Teach only love for that is what you are. <laughs> a little snippet. And, you know, I would do that. I'd be like... Yeah, so I put that on for a couple hours. Go around the room. Do I want the problem or do I want the answer? You know, it's, I mean, that's a pretty sharp question. That's beautiful. That's really coming right into the heart of it. Do I want the problem or do I want the answer? Teach only love for that is what you are. So um, maybe we'll have to do a program one time or a, maybe we can do that in tribe. <laughs> I mean, Kohei's got uh, eye gazing for one minute, but we could do course chants. <laughs> Our version of, uh, of Hare Krishna, course chants. Uh, and then it's just, they're quick, they're potent, they're powerful, and, the, and they remind the mind in a very direct way, in a kind of a catchy way too, about to stay focused. You know, what do I want? What do I truly want? So... Thank you, Esther. Always a joy. Give our love to Alan. <laughs> Thanks, Esther. Well, I see we have uh, the name Avita Yoga. You could go next. Hey, David. Hi. Hey. Um, I don't know if you remember me, but um, I got to know you when you first spoke on um, Buddha at the gas pump. This was probably 10 years ago. And I, I sent you an email. I was so moved by your interaction on that show. And, and you or Jason replied, and within three days, you guys showed up in Boulder. I don't know if you remember that when you, we met up at Estes Park. And, uh, and I was just, uh, uh, just blown away at, at the... The, the power of uh, your message and the spontaneity that you represented. So I'm sure you remember the weekend up there, but maybe yes. you don't remember me, but. Yes, are um, you John? <laughs> I'm Jeff, Jeff Bailey. Jeff. Yeah, sorry. Jeff. Yeah, I know it says Avita, but my name is Jeff Bailey. And Jeff. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, I've been following you and um, just loving your messages. And it's the first time that I've, participated on the Saturday workshop, but I've listened to many of these and love your message. And recently, or I should say maybe one, one of the recurring messages that you seem to share is your early stages, just like you did a moment ago, of sharing the early years of your learning and how you were, how Holy Spirit basically advised you to give everything away. And, uh, and, you know, you spoke about, uh, you know, okay, I'm, I'm shredding my resume. I'm putting it through the shredder. I'm throwing the resume. And no, no, you have to delete it from the computer. And so, and, I, and what I get is you gave all your money away too. And I just, I wondered if you could just speak a little bit to what that actually looked like. Did you, did you give it to charity? Did you stop using it? Did you, what? What did it look like to just wipe the slate clean? Well, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, actually, um, being a, a student for so many years and, and then finally paying off uh, student loans and, and all the basics of handling things that uh, the ego can take us into a hole and then the spirit can get us out. <laughs> 
and that was part of a clearing, I think, like you're saying, for me to, to start to trust in spirit to provide for everything. And actually, at the time, I, I didn't really have a whole lot of money in the bank. And then after the, the student loans were paid off, uh, I was pretty much living very simply with very little money and things would kind of just show up at the right time or when I would need something, uh, somebody would offer me something. So I was starting to get warmed up a little bit for where this was heading, which was more like in the East, they call it renunciation, where you're, you're a renunciate. Uh, I didn't know that word at the time, but that's kind of what I was being prepared for. And I do remember even in the university years, it, I was just on this uh, podcast with, with uh, uh, Jason and a group of people from uh, Brazil, and I shared the parable about how when I was in university and I had been hoping for a certain kind of car uh, for a number of years, ever since I was maybe in grade school on the way to church, I would pass by a Lincoln Mercury dealership and my little eyes, my little boy eyes were looking out at the Cougar XR7. I don't know if you remember Cougar XR7. I would be like, oh yeah, one of these days I'm gonna get a Cougar XR7. Well, by the time I got to university and I was in university, uh, I was in undergrad and then I saved up a little bit of money and I purchased the Cougar XR7. And I mean, I would I would polish it and clean it. I'd take a trip to the grocery store or the bank and people in the parking lot, where'd you get that cool car? You know, it's all self-concept, just a bunch of pride. Not too uncommon when you're when you're getting a car and you know, had those little turn signal lights, you know, on the back, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So it was very invested. And then I was at the university and I was taking some friends down to get some art supplies. And I was waiting behind some other cars. And I looked in my rear view mirror, my eyes got real big because a car was coming at high speeds and totally rear ended my Cougar XR7 um, and demolished it. I mean, I mean, it hit it so hard that it just cr crashed. It smashed those little light turn signal lights and a lot more. Uh, it busted the frame and everything else. And I remember taking it in and saying, what's it worth? And they said, it's totaled. Zippo. I didn't have insurance. I was like, I was psychologically devastated. And then I went to, to uh, one day I was praying on it, though. I said, what spirit? What is the purpose of this? My Cougar XR7 getting totaled. What is the purpose of this? And And the spirit was like saying, well you have a, a strong identity attachment with this car. And so I just have, have, am giving you a contrast experience to show you that. So then I got so euphoric that I went into my counselor, uh, guidance counselor, you know, university career placement counselor, and his name was Dan Church, even remember his name. And I said, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. My car just got totaled and I realized what a what an identity attachment I had with the car. And he said, what are you talking about? You should be said. <laughs> and, and I said, Spirit's like, this is for you. This isn't for your counselor. This is your realization. You, you can't share this with somebody else. It's for you. So I said, oh, a double blessing. <laughs> Loosening from the self-concept and realizing I can't share my insights with everyone that I want to share it with. So it did lead me to a point where I did pray to Jesus and offer Jesus everything. And then that did lead into a, a period from like uh, 1991 began like major travels, like, like on the travel on the road for weeks at a time. Uh, with really very little, no kind of organizational support, no savings, uh, no credit cards. Uh, and yet I was taken in by so many people that I'd never met. They were all new to me, but they took me into their house. They 
they gave me food, they gave me a place to stay, they, they gave me money for to put in the car for gas. And that began like a five year period from 1991 to 1996 of showing me what divine providence was, you know, like St. Francis had talked about divine providence and Mother Teresa and Peace Pilgrim, even a famous uh, mystic who, like our Swami, didn't begin her, her travels until her hair had turned white. That's when her like sannyasi uh, travels had begun after her hair was white. She had it back in a ponytail. But that started to convince me that I was cared for by something that was not something that I could visibly recognize. Like there was, I was being invisibly carried and all I was doing was showing up to share my joy and share my, my happiness. And it was quite uh, convincing too, especially after five years of it. I mean, that, that thoroughly convinced me in the reality of divine providence. And I think I needed every bit of those five years because I was raised with the Protestant work ethic. I was raised with uh, personal responsibility for finances personal responsibility for the body and for the bodies around me and so on and so forth. That, that conditioning was so heavily reinforced that I needed quite a lot of miracles to uh, wash that away, to reverse that entirely. But after those five years, I just was like a happy as a lark. I was like singing because I, th I was like, it's real. It's, it's, it's really there. I, I don't have to uh, doubt it or uh, worry about it. So that's how it went for me. That, that it went. It started off with some convincing synchronicities and, and things that were, got my attention. And then when Jesus told me, you know, to start traveling and he said, go west, like, just like with the Swami, go west. I'm like, west? Can you be a little more specific? No, uh, I'll tell you moment by moment, go west, get in your car and drive west. I'm like, all right, okay, I see how it's gonna be here. And, and it was beautiful, it was spectacular actually, but I, I had to uh, just be willing uh, like to follow what was in my heart. And what I really felt was that I was to travel and obviously Swami there, he felt he was to leave Calcutta and, and take a, a cargo ship to New York, uh, perhaps maybe with just an idea of starting a, a Krishna temple in New York City. But it was, it was unknown. He knew nothing about New York. And I knew nothing about what this life would be for me either. So I could certainly relate. But little by little, experience by experience, we, we become convinced. We just have to keep willing and open to being convinced by the Spirit. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. That's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Thanks, Jeff. We could go to Muna next. You can unmute there. Hi. <laughs> hi, David. Hi. Hi. Hi, Mona. Hi. Ooh. Yeah, uh, these movies, they just get so much stuck emotions in me. So I'm going to share the emotional bit first to get it out of the way. I had this intense fear in the um, breakout room. Uh, really, the heart was pounding and I didn't understand why. But when it came my turn to share, it was like looks like you've just frozen up, Muna. If you can still hear. Maybe we could come back to you. Okay, well maybe we'll go to uh Tina next. You can unmute there. Hi. 
<laughs> hey, <Dave. laughs> hey, everybody. Is your feedback? A little bit. Okay, I can turn this off. Or, I don't know. I'm just going to throw it over here. Maybe I'll. Is that better? <laughs> yeah. All right, cool, cool, cool. Ah, uh, howdy on, howdy on. <laughs> <laughs> David, oh my God, thank you. Oh, I love you so much. I love you so much. You know that though, right? How much I love you. I told you yeah. on the 4th yeah, of July. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you all. Hey, everybody. I'm going to try to talk slower because I know I wear the translators out. Okay. <sighs> This was amazing. This was amazing. This movie, uh, someone had put it in um, months ago. I think it was early in the year in Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment Facebook. And I watched it then. And just like the Yogananda movie, I couldn't stop watching it. I love it. I love these symbols so much. Um, I shared in the group, I have been having miracles with Krishna in the last couple of weeks. Don't know if I can retell it. I'm going to do my best <laughs> just to share it with you because I just want to share it with you. Uh, Krishna basically showed up to my dance class um, in the form of this really gorgeous woman who I was incredibly jealous of. Um, she took my spot. She was doing my shtick in the class because I'm the one in the class that's supposed to be getting all of this attention. <laughs> and my purpose for going to this class, I always say is I am the light of the world. That's my purpose. But the ego had apparently started to come to that class with me. Krishna showed up so this darkness could come up. She took my spot and I was watching my mind um, and realize that this was a state of mind that I'm in, I'm constantly in of finding my position, where am I, where do I fit in, competing and comparing. So I knew this wasn't, or I realized this wasn't an isolated incident, but this was an opportunity for forgiveness. And um, I just watched it happening. And then I watched what the next step was, was that now I'm gonna reject you guys. So I feel rejected, now I'm gonna reject y'all. So I wouldn't move out of this. I have another teacher that says, don't move. When these things are coming up, do not move. So I made my way home and I just sat with this and all of this darkness was coming up, but I would not move. I was like, it's hiding what I really want to get to. <laughs> so, so it was flooding up and I was, just, I really got to beyond a concept that this is just a competition with God. Like I have created this personality and I am gonna defend this personality and this persona because I wanna usurp the throne in a real way. And when I hit that, I was like, can, I can't believe that this is, I'm just a big freak, I'm a big fraud. And Holy Spirit, you have to be with me with this one. Like you really have to. So I just called the spirit in and it just, since then this has been this opening up of my heart like I didn't do anything like I just asked for help and my heart it's just exploded <laughs> <laughs> but I want to tell you I tested it out I went back to the class and she was there and it was cool I was able to join with everyone in the class. It was, they were my friends, we were joining. I danced when I wanted to dance. I didn't when I didn't want to dance. It wasn't, I didn't, wasn't forcing myself to do anything. So after the class, David, she comes up to me um, and she says, I have something for you. And she reaches into her bag and she pulls out the Bhagavad Gita. So I'm like, you Hare Krishna? Because <laughs> I was going to carry around the Bhagavad Gita. I'm like, Hare Krishna? She says, yeah, I'm Hare Krishna. And then she says her name is Govinda. Govinda is one of the names of Krishna. So I was like, oh. So um, I was just like, this is just amazing to me. I was like, oh, Krishna came to help me like open this up. And now Krishna is giving me the Bhagavad Gita. And there's a couple other parts of this story, but one part I want to tell you is um, we walked home together that night, but then I came back again and it wasn't quite done. I still was seeing victimization, but it wasn't in me this time. It was in my friend. So I wanted to defend my friend against Krishna or Govinda. <laughs> so this came up for me. So I thought, okay, this is still the same thing. It's not quite healed. I need to heal. So I was like, I'm going to just go home by myself and heal this. Krishna had other, other thoughts about that. <laughs> so, so I walked out. I'm like, I'm going to walk home. I'm going to do this. And uh, I hear down the street someone going, I love Jesus. I just love Jesus. 
So I turn around and it's Govinda on the corner because there's a church right next to our little where we dance. She's like praising Jesus. And I was like, oh, Krishna will not let me get away. So I turned around, I was like, all right, come on, come on. So we're both like, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, so today, so still there was a bit of, you know, stuff going on. Like it was in this body, this person. But today, she asked me if I was a Facebook and I was like, I don't know if I really want to be your friend yet. Still working it out with you. <laughs> so I was like, ah. Uh. Um, today, as we're watching the movie, I'm like, it's the Hare Krishna movie. <laughs> it's the Hare Krishna movie. <laughs> So I sent her a message and I was just like, oh my God, I was just like, we're watching the Hare Krishna movie. I'm with my friends and we're watching the Hare Krishna movie. And I told her, I said, I'm so grateful for you. And I sent it to her. And then my mind went, that's crazy. Like, what is she going to think of you? Like, who says that to someone? And I, and I was like, I think she understands. I think she knows who she is. So she messaged me back. This is beautiful message after message. All of these, like this, this love, love, love. And I didn't show her any love in form. I didn't really show her any love. I was trying to get away from her. But she responded with so much love. And so I'm just like, it's the miracle of Krishna. It's just this is a miracle, this symbol. And, and you in this group, every week, every week, every week, every <laughs> week you do this, every week. Like that was a symbol, you're a symbol. Of just how much, how much we're loved. And I just, so I don't say it enough. So I just wanted to uh, just really come on here and uh, just tell you. Thank you, thank you, Tina. That's it. That's our new movie. Is uh, is Jesus and Krishna? Shall we dance? <laughs> That's the way it's going now. You can't miss the symbols, considering all that you just went through, and then the movie. You know, Hare Krishna. You know, how obvious can it get? But go, yeah, sure, sure. That's what, that's kind of, I never can get to, but that's kind of the point. I'm so glad you're not able to just get to that. I told her, you know, like, um, my path is a course in miracles because my temperament is that of a, um, I can't say the word properly. Someone will correct me. Yana Yogi. I want to know stuff and I've always wanted to know stuff. So the course in miracles, just, it does that. You know what I mean? Like it helps me feel like I'm knowing something. So that's the path that is comfortable for this perspective. This is Jiva. But the bhakti, which is the Krishna, that bhakti, that joy, that just like dancing, that's also, I'm just feeling like I'm just opening up to more and more. Like, that's all I want to do. I don't really, I'm so freaking over concepts and talking about this stuff. And, you know, we can, I'm just, that's, holler at your girl when you want to have some fun. You know what I mean? Just, that's all I'm about right now. Holler at me when you want to do this part. Because mm -hmm. all of the concepts and stuff, like, we got that. I'm just ready to like, so I feel like this, that the last couple of weeks and then this movie was like, yes, it's time for the joy. It's time to be an expression. Like stop talking about being the light of the world and actually be that light of the world. It's enough of that. So yeah, so that's what I wanted to add. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I'm so glad this was like an answer to your prayer and, and all of our themes got covered and you know, too, we're even with our online retreats, we're kind of moving towards uh, Tabula Rasa online retreats, which will be very spontaneous. So we can have a bit of uh, chanting, course chants and dancing going uh, in our Tabula Rasa. We can move into the bhakti. We've we've covered the gnosis, the the yana, the yana yoga, yana yoga. Now we're like moving into the bhakti. So all right, Tina. <laughs> I love it. You got your rhythm on today. We're all, everybody's dancing too. See Patricia, Susan, yeah, Kat. We're there. Oh my gosh, everybody. Mexico, Ramon, <laughs> Ophelia. We're all dancing now. We're in the bhakti. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Love you. Love you, love you.
<laughs> Thanks, Tina. I see we have Muna back, so you can try again, Muna. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, it was a... <laughs> It was great. I mean, just what Tina said, stop talking about being the light and be the light is really what was my experience. But in the break, I got this, this really huge upset about realizing that why I'm always afraid about sharing is that when there's a human being in front of me, seemingly, I, I, I believe that so much is expected of me and I have to be to do something heroic to manage to meet the expectation. And uh, well, that was a, like a massive frozen consciousness, uh, you know, um, keeping fear inside my head. But um, I realize now how everything is connected because when I first saw him, I'm not gonna try and say his name because my mind is all over the place. I thought, my God, you look like I feel like old and tired and you cannot do anything, which is how I feel at the moment. But it, it slowly, as as the movie was unfolding, I realized it's not doing anything. It's all Holy Spirit. It came to me experientially, finally, how um, I'm never going to do anything. Like nothing, like whatever Holy Spirit is going to ask of me, it's going to be done through me. But I finally realized it. So um, I was thinking at the beginning of the movie, like I really have to get out of my way. You know, that this, this is a cliche, but it's exactly what we need to do. Get out of our own way so Holy Spirit can rip through us, you know, create through us. Um, and that was a beautiful reminder. And this, this belief that something is huge expected of me personally was a, a main obstacle to all this because I was like crouching in fear all my life. Like I can never meet those expectations. But obviously I'm the one bringing pressure on myself. I should do something heroic. I should do something that heals everyone. I should save the world even. It's like the character taking Jesus's uh, place. So yeah, that was really beautiful. And it's beautiful for me to see that hopefully that is the last missing piece of getting out of my way and, and be in the light and stop talking about the light, you know, walk the talk finally so uh yeah i loved it i love all these eastern traditions i love the vibrational aspect of them they speak to me vibrationally and that's the only time i really connect with god because conceptually you just cannot do it you just you just have to go quantum you know you just have to let go of all the concepts so thank you so much again it was fantastic movie it was a beautiful here for all of us, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mu. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We could behold it, especially. I like the ending too, with all the the little dancing little girl and the smiling faces, and then the the huge um, celebrations um, that they have, and all the 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 dust, the <laughs> the colored um, dust bursts going off into the air. Yeah, just, you can feel it. If you just watch it, you can feel it in your heart, but it's not conceptual. It's just like a, an expansive heart feeling. So I join you in that. We're, we're with each other in that way, and, and we're going more and more into it. The Tina just called it the bhakti. Okay, we're going bhakti now. Let's shift it into first gear, second, third, bhakti. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Muna. We can go to Patricia next. You can unmute. Uh, hi, David. <laughs> hi, Patricia. I'm not sure you want to unmute me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm lit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I thought you had some kind of. I got uh, the fire. <laughs> you have, you're on fire for us. I <laughs> forgot. That was a beautiful movie. You know, I remember one time you told me 
you know, Patricia, you, you have two major things that the ego really hold you on. First of all, is the, the government, then the, the authority problem, then the other one is religion. The religion, like I've been working a lot on it and I, I see so much peace, like especially with me with the um, Catholicism, but, and um, like I, before I, I've done so much work that I could not even enter any church or any, but now, and some other time I'll get to that story, but it's, you know, I, I, I'm free to go to these building and, you, you know, to appreciate and really to know, like, you know, when you mention anything about the Bible and everything, there is no more um, resistance and uh, it flows and I get the message, but before I couldn't because I, I, I was so anti-religion and I hated God so bad. Anyhow, so today um, that was so beautiful also because I thought that the, like, like what you presented to us today, this movie, it completely changed my mind. I, like I thought the Eric Krishna was like, I remember going to like all these airports and in, um, in Chicago or New York City or in seeing the Hare Krishna. And I was like, what kind of weirdo is this? These, I, I had so much judgment. I thought they were like the, like homeless people. Like I, but I didn't know they were such beautiful people. Oh my gosh, I was so wrong. Wow, please forgive me. I, my, my judgment was, wow. It's, uh, it, it's, um, and another thing, I'm so blown up with, I, I finally, I open up and um, this week on Tribe, I share something. And again, like it, everybody's blowing my mind. Like, I don't understand. There is so many loving people out there. This is, it's surreal. You share something and all of a sudden, you know, so somebody tells you, oh, yeah, I feel the same way. Thank you so much, Patricia, for sharing. Oh, my goodness. And I'm like, I thought I was a complete idiot and uh, that I was going to make a fool of myself. But no, instead, I'm helping someone. <laughs> it's, and, you, you know, to me, it means so much, this community. Um. I don't know how to tell you my appreciation to all the all the volunteer, you know, even like everybody that is working on, you know, putting those movies together. And I know as a manager, I've managed so many things in my life. Like it's so complicated, but in the same time, you guys make it like it's simple. Like this week I was watching um you know, in some of the, the prayers, like um, it was in Spanish. But again, I was looking at the, the, the person translating and like you guys were synchronized. You put your up here, your hands up here. And she puts her hand up here. And like you, you are, you're one. And that's what we are. We're one. It, it's really like it's Holy Spirit coming to us. I get it. The crucifixion, the time, and here we are. <laughs> Thank you. Love you. Love you. Love you, Patricia. Thank you. We feel your heart. You're just blossoming. You're blossoming now. <laughs> your true light is shining. Your true colors are coming through. <laughs> Uh, and you're lit on top of it. <laughs> yeah, we better be careful. If Maureen and I both end up with those torches, you know, we it's more like a circus show. But we'll just use hands for now. <laughs> we can go to uh, Susan next. You can unmute. Okay, God help me is how I started with the group earlier. Hugging, 
<laughs> you know, I've wanted to sing that for decades, right? Because as I told the other group, you know, I grew up in New York, Brooklyn, but hey, they came to Brooklyn too. Honey, honey, honey. And all over the city and all over the subways and Central Park and on television. I mean, this was, these were symbols that I seemed to grow up with. And I love the movie. Um, I think everyone knows already how much I love you, of course. Mm. I love you. And I love George. And I've always loved George. <laughs> um, always, always, always. I love George. I wore the button. You know, I just love him. I love the symbols. And what did the movie say? Or you said, yeah, make me dance as you like. I love that line because music and dance and bringing the Holy Spirit through. I mean, I just, really, it's just boom, boom, boom. I don't know what to say. You know, I just, I really have been in a state of bliss. Um, I woke up that way, but with this film, yeah. You know, with you, even more lit. And then during the movie, I get a text from a young man who could be Ravi Shankar's son. I know Ravi had a cameo in the movie. He was in there for a moment. This beautiful young man who's a musician is coming up with a couch any moment. <laughs> He's bringing this, I have no furniture in here. You know, I have a storage unit somewhere, but there's nothing here. And he texts me, oh, we can do it today. We can do it about five o'clock in here, you know. So any moment, a cap, a, this is the divine providence of a sofa to sit on is showing up. Oh, beautiful. No, no, I love the movie. I love, I cannot pronounce his name either, probably whatever. <laughs> um, I just feel all this bliss and all this joy and, you know, just, just grateful. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> just keep it going. What else? Anything else? Yeah, just, I said earlier, well, he said, back to the Godhead. I mean, how inspiring. Back to Godhead. We're there, you know, as much as possible, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just really in great joy. So. Yeah. Interesting that he wrote back to the Godhead and and started writing it on the birthday of his guru, um, because that was the guru's message, you know, all the time. And uh, well, I, th I know if I show that uh, George Harrison uh, documentary, Living in the Material World, uh, you'll be right there in the front row cheering him on. We might have to have an intermission in between the two movies uh, where you can come on again and do, do a, a nice Hare Christian dance and song uh because george would love that <laughs> he's like yeah 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 <laughs> he's with us he's with us i can feel it very strong we're getting really close to that documentary we're gonna have to, <laughs> have to you mark off two saturdays <laughs> for for that <laughs> thank you susan <laughs> thank you <laughs> Oh, the couch is on the way. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, yeah, maybe we could go to Veda next. You can unmute there. Hi, David. Hi. Hi, Veda. I can't believe it's you. <laughs> wow. Oh, I'm, I feel so blessed that you're in this, you're here with us. I watch a lot of you on YouTube and um, my spiritual advisor um, watches you all the time. And she told, and she, um, okay, I'll just be me. <laughs> I'll just be here. <laughs> when I was listening to everybody, spirit, gave me like three questions and one answer. And then I wrote down the question and then the answer came. Then I wrote down a question, answer came. So, and then for the last one, 
And then I've had this, I've asked um, Spirit for a new name for Christ because I don't easily identify with the outward look of him. His, Jesus' spirit, I understand, I feel. Yeah. But I don't identify with the, the facial thing of Jesus. So anyway, so I, I, so Krishna, that's my name. The answer came, the answer came. Oh, how beautiful. So, Perfect. yeah. This, this whole movie was all bringing you to that experience of something that really resonates in your heart. Beautiful. <laughs> That's it. And Veda, what a perfect name. And Veda goes with Krishna. <laughs> That's beautiful. The ancient Vedas. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, thanks, Veda. We can go to Kat next. You can unmute. Good afternoon. Hi, Kat. Good morning. I guess we're all over <laughs> the world, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, wow, I'm just so grateful to be here. I, I normally don't get to attend during the movie. I mean, I watch it with y'all and, and engage. Uh, I normally get to watch afterwards and listen. And, and that's been wonderful. I just barely finished The Island. Wow. <laughs> anyway, this was, I loved this movie. Um, I just loved this movie. It, yeah, what's with this? This, this is Krishna, this is Jesus. Everybody's raising their hands to the Lord. <laughs> That's right. You know, that used to just bother me. <laughs> now, you're, <laughs> now you're doing it. Wow. I'm doing how, it. I'm doing yeah, it. I'm we're, dancing we're taking to over. you. I'm dancing yeah. to you. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just had a, a wonderful week. Um, my daughter and her husband went away on business and I got to sit the house and my my young grandsons uh, 11 and 13 and that can be a a, a tough age to deal with sometimes <laughs> and so it was a great learning experience for me because it gave me some money forgiveness opportunities and during during this week I've uh, relied on you a lot and 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 tribe helped a lot in the expression sessions on monday great i love them thank you and uh, but during this week i've i've been able to um you use a a little aff affirmation stop drop and roll and that has been uh, so useful. I've been able to get finally into, from the mind watching and being vigilant about that and, and feeling the emotions that can come up. I've learned to go, whoa, wait a minute. What is this? And, and immediately ask Holy Spirit to come in and, and to help. And when I do that, I the presence, the present moment is right there. And I feel the joy and I feel the wonder of my surroundings. And I'm sometimes amazed that people around me don't seem to see it. And it's just, it's been a great week. And this was just the ending to it mm -hmm. that, that I needed. Hmm. Wonderful movie. Thank you so much, David. And, and I do love you. Oh, and all, love of, you. all of you. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, love you, Kat. Thank you. We, yeah, this movie was the whipped cream and cherry on top of that week. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thanks, Kat. Let's go to Ramon and Ophelia next. You guys can unmute.
Uh, gracias, Pete. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, David. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, David. Thank all the team. In this search, this long search I've had for years, I've been looking for a guide, a guru, a teacher. And I've, I've been through a lot. And it, everything has been perfect, of course. But today, I feel so blessed to be able to feel in my heart that you are my guru in life. The movie was beautiful, watching how the Swami was a guru for so many. And I feel blessed because I feel in my heart that you are one of these gurus, teachers in my life. And I'm just feeling blessed. And how with love and humility, you tell us every road leads to God. It's not only me. And to see that humbleness in you, to open your heart and tell us all that it's with the Spirit. It's, it's me, but it's also you. And I feel such emotion and such peace to, to have come together in this time, in this life, to come close to you with your guidance. And I know you are a symbol of the Holy Spirit on earth for me. You, you, show, myself, you show yourself as a body so I can listen to the guidance and find my way back home. <laughs> thank you and thank you all my brothers who are here with us and from all religions and all, the whole planet because we're holding hands and we're going together thank you for guiding us David thank you for being with us I love you, I love you all uh, uh, thank you thank you thank you Ramon and Ophelia yes yeah we're, we're brought together to, to be in the joy and the love together and yeah, it's so beautiful knowing you and walking with you hand by hand. And we just keep taking the steps. That's all we're doing. That's all we're doing. So thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. We have uh, Annabelle. You can unmute there. Hiya. Hello. Can you hear Hi. me all right? Hiya. Yes. Hello. Oh, so lovely to be here. Um, I, I kind of echo everything that everyone has said. Um, it's, it's been su such a beautiful movie and such um, a beautiful synchronicity really this week in terms of uh, around prayer and, and music and chanting. Um, I participated in a, a retreat last weekend um, it was the Women of Peace um, event, which was shared on Facebook. And it was a really huge opportunity um, for uh, forgiveness of judgment of um, different expressions and people um, walking different versions of the same path. Um, but I was so intrigued to hear everybody speaking and all the different sharings um, of, of their own missions. And one that really, really lit me up um, was, was including talking about uh, using music and chanting as a way of, of prayer and as a way of unifying everybody. And, and I, I really loved hearing about that. And then I, I caught some of your, you, you shared um, a talk about prayer and I've only managed to watch a small part of it, but you said something about um, prayer being like music being prayer so all through this week there's been like I'm seeing that prayer is is really everything and there's something about the music and, and the chanting and um, I could really feel like when you're speaking about it and when I think um, this man called the deal I think was talking about it at the weekend he was he was saying about if, if everybody around the world in their own languages with their own faiths were to chant the word God um, I think he, that's what he was saying. All together, 
like think how how powerful and healing it, it, it would be and, and if there was also music and dancing like a, a massive online event and I just thought that's so beautiful and then you were just saying now wouldn't it be fantastic to have like a, a, a miracles chant and um and then seeing how how lit up Tyna was and also Patricia as well like how animated they, they are I I love to see that because I'm not naturally that way myself but I could I can feel how much you know music or singing like sometimes I sing the lessons like my lesson today was um there's nothing to to fear so I found myself singing that earlier because sometimes it it just helps it helps um open things up and move things around and bring it to life really and also I think the the reading with with that lesson today on Spreaker I think you were saying about how um it, it doesn't matter the differences like it doesn't matter the different where people are coming from but if they're all unified in one goal then all the differences get unified and that's been such a that's been so much part of this week as well and through this film as well like about the sameness um so yeah it's just really so so much synchronicity and um and, and yeah and, and forgiveness of, of judgment and it feels like I'm really like focusing more just on the one goal and the, the oneness and even um there was something else in the I think it was in 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 the reading before the lesson um to do with it's almost like if if the mind's even if the mind's not always in in integrity or always aligned just the, the willingness to see that the laws of God are, are universal means that um, the right mindedness kind of gets applied in every situation. So, for example, even in the situation with my partner, um, we're not romantically together as a couple, but we're under the same roof with our little boys. There's been a lot of hatred really between us and, and very difficult to see a way out of that. But somehow through all of the synchronicity this week and the and the, and the one the single-mindedness and the, the goal even though sometimes when I look at him it's very hard for me to feel anything remotely loving somehow like this evening he'd, he'd made he'd made a lovely dinner and I for the first time in a long time I was able to just really appreciate that he'd done that and there were no it, it was a very like cleanly appreciative thought so I thought so everything that's everything that I'm learning and everything that I'm taking in is coming out uh, in a right-minded way even with even with huge resistance in my mind and even with me not finding it always so easy to be aligned with that so I'm kind of seeing how everything's working together for good which I've heard you say many times and I'd really really love for there to be some kind of chanting or, or as a form of prayer I think because I just think it helps to it just helps to like somebody was saying earlier on like lifting her hands up and that's exactly how I felt it just helps to align everything and and just cut all the other stuff out it just yeah to, to, to keep to keep to be on track but in a very jubilant and joyous and expressive way which I, I really think I would absolutely love so thank you very much wow. <laughs> thank beautiful you, you do beautiful. You. okay well we've we're lining up here, Annabelle and then Susan. So we might have to come up with a, a, a course chance for our for one of our uh, sessions or retreats or something. Maybe we could even do that in, during the breakout rooms one week. We, we could we could have we could have course chants in between and and see how that works. Then everyone really may be dancing for the final session coming out of that. <laughs> That's beautiful. So thank you. We're we're getting the votes coming in already for course chants. You know, my friend Thomas Dunn, he he just would take uh, a, a course lesson and he had people there with drums and cymbals and uh, some of them would play other music, guitar or whatever simple instruments and then they all come together and they start chanting the course chants, sometimes just the lesson or some other additional lines from the lesson. And I just would put it on uh, the whole album on on shuffle or repeat 
and have a have a party in my room. <laughs> so we're we're gaining momentum here. We'll we'll get our hands going up and our course chants going and drums and cymbals like uh, our our Swami. He always had his drum there, but uh, we'll have something. So thank you, Annabelle. Thank you. I'm so glad you could be a part with all of us. We're all the same one. Yeah. Thanks, Annabelle. We can go to Monica next. You can unmute. Hola. Hola. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Si. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. For me, it was beautiful, the documentary. And, and I, I told the small group, what comes to me is a lot of inspiration. I'm asking the Spirit to show me what I have to do. You, you told me, David, once that that's what I have to do. Open up and let some, someone or someone to share. But I also want to share something else. About three weeks ago, I, I told you something about my mother, how I saw her when I was a kid and how much I perceived this victim um, face in her. And a few days ago, it was really, really cold here where I live. And suddenly the image of my mother came to me and it was like a very warm image. That the only thing that I started saying was, thank you, mother, thank you. It was like, Oh God, I've got to honor her because with her, I experienced not only me, but me and my brothers and sisters, we experienced such beautiful things that there was love there. Even though um, I, I actually remember that my older brother, um, we just like to get in to bed with her and be really close to her and we'll jump in. So I told a friend here who's 10 years uh, old, and I said, Moni, come and join with me. Come and get into my bed. And that experience was, it, 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 it joins that documentary in, in my mind. It's like the image of my mother, this documentary, like she was a victim and all that. But now it seems as if that presence of love and unity between us, I could sense it. My brothers and sisters and my mother and me, I'm looking at the past, I thought, but it's, it's, there was love in the past, wasn't there? It, that comes from God, at least for me. <laughs> and, and I just need to integrate this documentary and that's why I like it so much. The same with um, the one we watched before, the, the preacher, how he integrated everything. And I want to thank you, David, for showing me that, because I admire that. More and more I follow you. I've seen other teachers, actually, uh, course teachers too, but no. <laughs> Someone told you the other day, that there were other teachers that were rigid, but you're always happy. And that's what I like the most. <laughs> and that's why I'm grateful. I want to say thank you. <laughs> what I discovered in you, I'm grateful. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. We feel your heart. We feel your heart. We'll rejoice and, and be happy and let the Spirit keep showing us the way every day. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Well, we have uh, Wesley and Angie. You guys can unmute there.
There we are. Hey. Hi. Hi. Um, so I guess first, the thing that comes to my mind right now is I want to say thank you. There's a few people from the community that helped us be here today. We spent all our money on, on our honeymoon and uh, just trusting that everything was going to flow and, and the perfect lessons came up and the guidance came and it was to ask for support and we did and we were supported to pay for the money and some groceries. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and leading up to this movie, um, a few days prior, I started talking with a, a friend who I've been connected with for a number of years. Uh, we met in Thailand. I, I like let go of my career and everything. And I went to Thailand and 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 he was just at a table next to me in, in a cafe. And at, at that time, I'd never done this before. I just looked over and I said, hey, how are you? What, what's going on? I was very shy for many, many years. And it turned out he was from my city. And so we started talking and he was like guiding me through different things over several days, like healing modalities, acupuncture and stuff. And he was a Shivite, like, so it was a Hindu. Um, and so over the years we've talked and, you know, I've developed some awareness in, in that lineage. And, but uh, now it's like, I feel like that I've come into the Course in Miracles. There's almost like an aversion to any of these other steps that I've seemingly taken along the way. Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever ism. And over the last week, like I mentioned, a, an old teacher that I had that I that contacted me this week and said some they're just basically illuminating some darkness for me, some unconsciousness. Um, but it felt very like uh, like averse and like like get away. And then and then my friend, I started talking with him. He lives in India and um, we started talking about whatever. It was yoga and and Angie's had some pain in her body and like how to like treat those pains using some of the stuff from, from like Ayurveda and, um, and, and the like Hatha yoga. But I felt this like aversion, like, oh no, I'm with the Course in Miracles now. And it's like, I need to like go like this. Um, and, and, then, and then the day after I talked with them a lot, these two Vedic astrologers from India, India added me on Facebook. And then another uh, Indian, Buddhist guy added me on Facebook, and today a, a guy from Bangladesh added me on Facebook, and it was just like so. So this has been coming up for me, and almost like a guilt for for wanting to and, and practicing like physical yoga practices, um, which I dove into really like like the practice that I developed over a period of time. I dove into it again, like like fully for the first time in a long time. And had a bunch of stuff come up after the whole bunch of healing. We felt like like there was this split. Like I can't do this. It doesn't fit. Even though there's these other ideas that the Holy Spirit can use anything that I that I enjoy. And, and, and my intention in prayer is when I'm practicing the physical yoga to actually use that to release the belief in the body. Um, there's still yeah this guilt, this judgment of other paths and the paths that I've walked. And then so you play this movie. And right at the very beginning, you're like, uh, there's only one. And all of these paths are leading to the same place. And this is like, I mean, this is in my mind already. This is obvious. But it was like, this was the correction. And it was right at the very beginning. And this whole week, and it was like a lot of like, really like, a lot of emotion, heavy emotions that were moving me all over the place. Like, I mentioned to you in the, the message, I said lots of fear was coming up. And, and then just to have this come, like it was like the, the, the self on the wound, kind of, so to speak. It was like, ah, here you go. And, and my friend in India, I love him so much. And I love you so much. And like, it's like, there's these two aspects of two projections of my consciousness. And it's like having them come together. Um, oh, yeah. And I know, I know there's just guilt on it. Like I'm, like, and, and there's the idea, of I need to do the right thing. There's a right thing and a wrong thing. And the one I'm in right now is right. The other one's no longer right. Um, so this is, I, I just want to expose that. Um, and there's another thing when it was in the, the breakout room, um, 
I noticed as I was talking about this, when I talk about some of the other experiences I've had, there's a bunch of pride there. Um, and it just really doesn't feel good. I and mean, it's like, I wasn't able to be fully present. And it was just like, oh, I'm going to say this thing. And like, people are going to think this. So a self-concept, I want to maintain it. So the, it primarily shows up around Buddhism. Um, the time that I spent in Buddhism. Um, and I want to put that, I put that on the altar like, for years now. But I want to put that on the altar again. And, and ask for the correction in that and be gentle with myself because you know it's it'll be done when it's done the, the pride and whatever else is there <sighs> so thank you yeah this was this is beautiful and i didn't know much about the harry krishnas i did have some some judgments a little bit i met some harry krishnas in vancouver one time um so it was really nice to see what it was actually about and and it was it was beautiful to see his devotion there were like multiple times in the movie where i just my heart just opened and i started crying because i felt like like i just the word comes adoration i just adored this man and like his commitment like he was it was so he was just like so committed fully committed to the spirit to make that leap at that age to go from india to new york like totally blind like just trusting the spirit and that's it like there was nothing that, like that no money no like no food like going into winter i mean these are things you mean i'm from canada even that for me would be like a stretch to jump into winter again without like just knowing anything just it was beautiful and i wanted the the word courage comes to mind but i don't even think it was courage it was faith and i think that was, was, for me those seem to be two different things like courage is courage is, is I mean, for me, it hasn't been authentic at times. It's been not listening. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Yeah, we're being lifted. It's, we're being lifted into this all-inclusiveness where the symbols are all bringing, bringing our mind to this one point of, of love and inclusiveness. So it's beautiful that that you're just able to watch those thoughts come up of this way or that way or or so on and so forth, however it comes to to just be present and to let it be shown and and be obvious. And yeah, I think that's what I like the most of it. You know, I had my period of, of study and prayer and everything, but then once I started being guided to travel, I just Jesus had his way with me. He took me to, to churches and synagogues. He took me to ashrams. He took me to places, you know, as I traveled, I would get invitations. And um, it was fun. It was like being on a, on a, some kind of a water slide ride, you know, just being carried to meet so many different people. And he was just saying, keep showing up and stay present with me. Just stay present and I'll show you, you know, like that, uh, that song, I can show you the world shining, shimmering, splendid. You know, that's what the feeling I had, like, you know, I'll take you into a state of mind where you can actually feel the connection. But that old kind of analytical uh, mind that, that wants to kind of analyze and compare and contrast that needs to get rinsed quite a bit. And then as that happens, your appreciation just grows. Like today with, uh, with the Swami, you know, you probably could see uh, where you and, and Angie are in your path with just trusting day by day. And then you see the Swami show up in New York City with no money. And you're like, oh, Swami, thank you. You know, because he was just, doing that for you, demonstrating, like, watch, watch and see, watch and see how God provides. So, yeah, it's beautiful. And even just being able to be open to receive, to come on to the movie today, you know, there it is again. And it just, that's very convincing as you keep staying with that. One day at a time, convinced, convinced, okay, there it is again, there it is again. And yeah, that's how, how it goes. That's how we're, we're convinced. 
So thank you both for your faith. Oh, and Angie's got some. We got us. We switch over to the Espanol channel. <laughs> I want to express my gratitude to lots of gratitude for you, David, for everyone. As Wesley said, all the symbols, all the support of the love of God. And you, could you guys put it on Spanish? I've been supported for a year since I went to La Casa, and in many ways. And the movie showed me that the devotion to God. That's the one thing that should provide anything and everything I need, all the apparent needs I have in the world. And I also wanted to express the miracles, all, all the, the healing that has gone on in my body. I had a terrible pain in my back. I couldn't, I could barely walk. At times I was paralyzed. But the day we went down to the cascade, there were so many symbols of Jesus. He was with me. And Wesley left because I was afraid to, to walk. And I, I just stayed there. I, I, I'm not going to be able to walk like an hour going downhill and then climb up. Impossible. I was so afraid. I, I, I was afraid to, to fall down or hurt myself anymore. And when I stayed in the car on my own, I, I, many symbols came. I found a friend from my uh, hometown, uh, a friend of my brother, and I started talking to him. And with what he told me, all sorts of things started to, I have to, I have to walk through the identity. I kind of felt that I was upset. I could see the identity, my, my personality, and how I was hurting myself by not trusting, by staying there, and not knowing that, not wanting to know that I was able to do it with Jesus. And when I talked to him, he said, my brother was feeling just like you, and he went down. And, and he walked with a stick, and it was okay. He was worse than you are, but he made it. And, and it helped his back. So I thought that was a symbol. I think Jesus is telling me that I can do it. Because the other guy said, I, I can give you a stick. And you can try. And, and that will make you feel more secure and hold it. So I was able to go down on my own because Le it was the left. And even though I was walking on my own, I felt secure with Jesus. And then right at the bottom, I, I came across Wesley. And I, I was able to make it. Even when I was down there, there, there was a, a, a kind of a church with a, a picture of Jesus. And I, it was a symbol for me. I, I'm sustained by the love of Jesus. And I just have to hand all my fear over to him and all my thoughts. And from there, something unblocked in my back and then it went down to my leg and it was an unbearable pain it made me cry my leg the pain made me cry and i was able to watch all the thoughts um the idea of what's going to happen or what happened with my relationship with wesley all the attack thoughts that i was attacking wesley and my body and everything then other situations happened here in the house one night we had sex, Wesley and I. There was no water in our room. So we left the water pump um, on and it burned. And when I went down and I saw that it had burned and there was water all over the place, I said, well, what are we going to do? 
I didn't realize, but so much guilt was coming up. I couldn't, I could only see it yesterday. It was the opportunity to, to hand over all that guilt because I felt um, guilty for having sex because there is a family next to us. Like this father figure, I felt I had done something wrong and I felt guilty about it. And, and the thing with the water pump really like helped me brought that up, uh, bring that up to the light because I wanted to surrender it. And yesterday, the, the pain in my leg was a bit less. There was guilt, guilt, guilt coming from everywhere. And then yesterday we went to the lake with Peter and um, I, I was feeling well um, and, and Pete was feeling good and, and Wesley was doing a massage on him. And then he held my hand and then more guilt was coming up. But then it was about my mother. I feel guilty for having left my mother behind, for not being with her because I'm with Wesley, Wesley and all that stuff. I started crying and surrendering it. And in an instant, after surrendering it all, the pain in my leg disappeared and it's not back. It's like, it was like an instant that I cannot feel the pain, that hard pain any longer. And then, something started hurting on my jaw and I couldn't eat. And it, when I was eating, it was like heavy and it was like a cramp. And I was watching all that, the guilt, the guilt coming up and then just keep surrendering, keep surrendering. And today after surrendering it all, I, I don't feel much. You know what I mean? So just watching all that guilt, all the ways and, and uh, it was showing up in my expression and, and, and feeling the miracle and going through the process. Oh, I just want to say thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Wesley. Yeah, there's a lot of faith of just letting it pass through like clouds passing by and keep praying and praying and releasing and saying, I won't. I won't hold this. I give this to you. I give this to you. And then, yeah, it's very encouraging as things leave awareness like that with the prayer of surrender. So beautiful. Well, we're right there with you. Oh, we have one more thing. Another thing that the movie brought up in me is that like spiritual path before getting to the course. I was for 13 years in the Isha system. It was similar to Osho and all that. It's a, a meditation system, non-dual, that it helped me connect with my heart deeply before getting to the course. So when the course came to me, the course gave a voice to that experience that I felt in my heart. And being at La Casa de Milagros, I kind of felt guilty using the Isha meditation system. And I had to let it out, let it go. And when the movie was showing today, I suddenly felt there's nothing wrong. I don't have to feel guilty. It's all part of the path. And I felt a lot of gratitude to be able to do whatever spirit brings to me and just integrate it all. Thank you. Mm. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. That's it. It seems to be a lot about allowance and permission to, to really feel inside what resonates and really go with that. And then as you go forward, everything that we need, whether it's even structure or discipline or or to meet a certain person, it just, everything just falls like, like healing drops of rain on our head, uh, just pre like bathing us and basking us in the, all the light and, and love. And then we can feel it in our hearts and share it. So I like these uh, movies. Wow, you, I never know what's coming in, <laughs> but I'm like you, I rejoice. 
to see what the spirit is delivering for us this week <laughs> and then we all have such a a marvelous time a, a precious time together so well i thank you all uh, how are we doing do we i think i see pete up in the corner we might have one more expression and and then we'll wrap it up for today but i see pete there Hi, David. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Pete. Hi. I, I, I feel a little bit nervous that I'm doing this so last minute. I, I'm having the concept that it's like time to wrap up and it's too little too late. But since uh, I'm here now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go for it. Um, thank you. I was just with Wes and Angie the whole time for the whole day. And then I felt it was time for me to go, but I still felt to be connected. So I had it on my phone and I walked home and got home and got my computer on. I was like, okay, I think I need to, to do something here. Um, I think I have a fear with you, David, that I've not been able to quite face actually, since I've known you, I've been aware of you and talking to you from time to time for seven or eight, I don't know, a number of years now. And, but I still have a, I think I have a, a strong fear concept around you and about asking direct questions to you. And especially with things that are going on with me that seem to be chronic, in the breakout group today, I heard a number of people share that they deal with chronic body conditions. And that's, that's been something that's been going on with me for a long time too. And I feel like I just have this, I, there's a fear of like, of even bringing it up and approaching it in some way, because I, there's some kind of fear that I don't, that I'm, that I just continue to make this thing happen, these body symptoms and and that I'm not really going to get any new information at this point. I'm not getting any new realizations. I'm past the point of being excited about new metaphysical concepts there, that that stuff isn't happening anymore. I just, um, but I'm also not in a place where I feel that, that the journey is getting lighter or more joyful. It seems like there is a certain aspect of it that has felt like most of it still feels dark and heavy. And the body's discomfort seems to take most of my strengths. The experience is that most of my experience is that I have to mentally be strong to break through the physical fatigue that's here. Even in this moment, I feel very heavy. Like I just want to lay down. I want to, it's, um, it takes a lot of focus and energy to just even try to get myself to this point to share and speak with you. Um, and it seems like it's been that way a long time. That's what it seems. It seems it's been chronic for many years now without any big new realizations or healing miracles happening. It just seems to be very consistent. So I guess I'll just, um, I just want to say what I've been doing and then whatever you share is whatever you share, of course, but I, I do have a desire to hear a specific question answered if one can If it, if it can come, if it's meant to come, a specific answer. Um, what I've been doing for, um, for the past year or so is um, trying to really radically um, accept any of the conditions as they come. So really sitting with um, the body pain, the, the thoughts that it's chronic, the belief in time, the belief that it continues to the extent that, you know, I'll be laying on the floor crying, having all these symptoms and shaking and just and just trying to go into it so deeply to just witness while that happens. And when it happens, I do my best to just say, just watch, just watch this. Don't worry about trying to fix this. Don't worry about finding out one day that there's a disease you haven't discovered that you have yet. And there's a way to resolve these symptoms. Just watch. And sometimes there is a radical acceptance and something beautiful does come and some catharsis comes afterwards. And there is some kind of release and some kind of understanding that it is me choosing all of this and that I'm just not at that point of letting go yet, but I can only keep stepping forward and be willing. And then I can only do so much, only so much is my, my part and the rest is of the spirit. So I just feel to say that and just, I don't know, I guess I'm, looking for some kind of confirmation or direction like the am, am i am i follow am i being wise am i still being totally foolish 
am I just totally blocked? Um, those are the, those are the thoughts and questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pete, for just pouring that out, you know, pouring out what's on your heart. I think when it comes to what seems to be repeating um, chronic symptoms that if you if you do go back into your mind, you know, you can you can kind of simplify and go deeper into toward the light by by just looking at the question in an honest way, which is what do I still believe I'm responsible for in the world? Because when we still hold on to some kind of a belief and responsibility for the body or for certain relationships or for certain situations or circumstances, we hold on to guilt instead of releasing it. And what the Spirit shows us is, is sickness always, all sick, sickness symptoms simply come from guilt. It's a projection of guilt. And we want to be free of that. We, we want to release the guilt. And the guilt comes from a, a false sense of responsibility where we've taken on some sense of responsibility for something that seems external to our life. And once we're able to start to get in touch with that, then we can begin to realize we can let it go. Uh, because our, our peace of mind, our experience of God, our, our inner presence, uh, is is our responsibility. That is what is asked of us to to come toward that. And when we have set up uh, what seems to be external circumstances or symptoms, we're almost like the mind is trying to set up jailers uh, and to to be held in prison by these jailers. And the, the direction out of it is just to start to be able to ask that, that question honestly, like what, what do I still believe I'm responsible for in the world? And that question can be the, like the wrench that loosens the bolt uh, that's been on there very tight. It just takes another turn, loosens it, loosens it up. So, the ego is quite good at not only generating a, a world and a false sense of self, but, but building a case uh, of you're responsible for this and this and this and this. And, and then the, each time we do fall for that, it just holds on to and reinforces the guilt. But when we can honestly ask that question, like what am I still holding on to in terms of the a responsibility for the world, then that that starts to loosen it. And, and for most people, like even the body itself, there's there's just been this conditioning that that I am responsible for the body. And the truth of the matter is, I'm re responsible for my state of mind, and and that is where my my happiness and my release comes in. But it can take the form of with children or with partners or with parents. It can take the form with uh, colleagues where there's some kind of belief or reinforced belief in like a, a responsibility there with, with something or someone. And then, then we carry that and don't really realize that we're just we're just holding on to something that we don't need to hold on to. So Can that's you hear me, David? yes. Is there anything? I don't want to monopolize it the time if it's time to finish up. But I mean, the desire in my heart now is to just like, is there something that you hear for me, or is there any direction or guidance on like how for me to go into that question? Because I, I feel like I've been asking it. Maybe I haven't. Maybe I'm just haven't gone deep enough in, towards this honesty. I, I don't. I don't really know. But the concept you're sharing is familiar to me, but I'm still feeling a certain sense of like, okay, I thought I was doing that, but maybe I'm not. And if I'm not, 
what do I do to find out, to know that I am actually asking the question, honestly, what am I thinking I'm responsible for here? Yeah. Well, like, like Angie was just sharing previously when she had the extreme pain in the back and then uh, it shifted, you know, into her leg and then it shifted into her jaw. And in each case, she had to kind of go inside to go for a, like a handing it over or a release. So I would just say that that it can be shown. You just have the willingness to have it shown. Like if, if you experience a chronic pain or whatever, and you feel like, I just need to lay down. I just need to lay my body down right now. And then, then take the time during that time to, to go into like just that honest question. What, if, what do I believe I'm responsible for here? You know, and that's the time to do it. It's almost like an, an inner surrender where you where you just are saying, "It show me, show me where I believe I'm responsible for something. And then that can be your practice. It's like you don't you don't try to fight the the feeling. You don't try to to come up with a, a technique or something, but you do, really just ask yourself that question when when something like that arises for you and it can be even right now like after we are off the air if you if you feel like a sense of of fatigue even like i'm tired i'm tired of this like i've i'm tired of of this condition and then you just allow yourself to just lie down on the floor and and go into the the question that I just was posing, you know, what, what is it that I believe I'm responsible for? And just from a place of relaxation, just lie, let the body lay down and, and just go for it with that, with that question in mind. Yeah, we're all with you. We're so glad that you're here and you're sharing this with us because all of us hold you in our prayers for this, because I, I know that's the prayer of your heart. Very sincere prayer is just to be free. That's all you want is to be free. Yes. So thank you, Pete. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. Been a beautiful full day for us. Another adventure, <laughs> a deep dive. And again, we'll put out our movie polls. And if you have any themes that you come to, you want to vote for, or I think now we have it, you can vote for, for all of them, right? That's a, it's unrestricted <laughs> polling. <laughs> I know some of you are boom, boom. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And then look what look how it plays out with these uh, amazing movies. <laughs> so thank you all. I bid you a temporary farewell for now, but love you and see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>